It's just the August one, right? Yep. Okay, I'll go back down here. And Periscope is tweeted. everybody and welcome to another edition of tunnel vision a show brought to you by uscfootball.com i'm your host keely or joined by ryan abraham and shotgun sprattling the og crew is back ready to talk about usc's 52 to 32 win or 35 win over ucla their season f regular season finale over a rival uh, getting a good win in the coliseum a uh, usc ends the regular season eight and four which i will tip my hat to shotgun and i we predicted that you guys had it we did uh and then we'll talk about what this means for USC in general. There's kind of been a holding pattern. If Utah somehow trips up against Colorado next week, could that mean USC goes to the Pac-12 championship? We'll see. Well, it, it would if they didn't beat them, but we'll see if they beat them. Yeah. That's, I guess that's what I'm saying here. Um, what does this mean for the future? What does it mean for Clay Helton? What will Mike Bone do? So we'll talk about all of that. And of course, wherever you're watching, Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, put your comments, questions, and concerns. We'll answer them, put them on the screen. You can also call us, 512-4-TUNNEL. Like I always say, free therapy. Call us with your questions, comments, concerns, all that good Welcome stuff. Welcome to our couch. Yes. <laughs> we are here standing by ready for therapy uh hey, but keely can i give a shout out real quick sure do it what so my mom's in town from boston and we were doing our grocery shopping for thanksgiving mm -hmm. and uh, a very nice woman approaches me and says hi ryan uh you know and you know i listen to your podcast and stuff all the time her name is linda her and her husband were shopping they're big usc fans and she's like, i've seen you around town it was in hermosa beach but i haven't approached you i'm like please come up and say hello so hi linda thanks for coming to say hello oh wow you just wanted to flex that you're a celebrity at Vaughn. No, at Vaughn. Yeah, at Vaughn's. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you're Vaughn's. a lo lo local selfie celebrity, Ryan Abraham. <laughs> but guys, USC finishes out the regular season a week early. Uh, they get their second bye next week. So it's kind of a, a interesting finish for USC. I'm going to start with the game and then we're going to go broad. So everyone, hold on. I know everyone's already sending in questions about Clay Helton and all that stuff. But we're going to talk about the game first. People want to know about Clay Helton? Maybe. Okay. Strange. Maybe. Very strange. It was a record-breaking uh, regular season finale for the Trojans. Uh, Keen Slovis broke the single game USC record for passing yards. Four USC wide receivers had over 100 receiving yards. Pretty crazy. Uh, and the first yeah. time USC's offense scored 50 points, 50 plus points since the 2017 Rose Bowl against Penn State. So a lot of things happening yesterday in the Coliseum. But what were your overall takeaways, guys? It was crazy. I mean, the the offense played at a, such a high level. Maybe we thought we'd, we'd see that more throughout the season. Uh, but, you know, Keaton Slovis, to his credit, is a true freshman, got banged up a little bit, was throwing picks at times. And, you know, the end of the season, I know it wasn't the hardest schedule, but he played a lot better. I thought he made a lot better decisions. You see the emergence of a guy like Drake London coming on, the, you know, and when Tyler Vaughn's is out, he has a big game. And then Tyler Vaughn comes, Tyler Vaughn's comes back, and all of them have big games. And, I talked to Tyler Vaughn's after the game, and the, you know, three of the four wide receivers had over 100 yards. The one that didn't was Michael Pittman, which was kind of crazy. 
and he just needed like six yards or something at the time, or I forget what it was. It was so, it wasn't a lot. And they throw that one pass at the very end to get him the yardage. And, and Tyler Ron's told me, like, yeah, they, they knew they were aware. I asked I asked Michael Pittman that too, and yeah. he kind of bashfully laughed. He's like, Yeah, we do. So they, they were, were trying. Aware. But yeah. I mean, when the secondary puts that you UCLA secondary, we talked about being pretty much garbage and they were garbage in this game. They gave, you know, normally three hundred yards a game. This one they gave up five hundred. I don't mind that. Like that's a kind of a neat little anecdote you can put, you know, feather in your cap at the end, like, hey man, we had four guys go for over 100 yards. I guess it's only happened twice this century, and the other time was Texas Tech back in, like, 2005 when Graham Harrell yeah. was a backup Graham quarterback Harrell. at the time. He wasn't the quarterback, though. He was, like, a backup quarterback. He was still there. He was present. He was present for it the, the two times. So, I mean, that's kind of crazy, you know, yeah. the, the, all kind of the records. I know the offense is different now, but it's great. I mean, it's good to see. I think Graham Harrell was a good hire. It hasn't been perfect along the way, but they, they've done a lot of things with the talent they have, and it's a really talented group. I mean, there was a lot of problems, I think, defensively contain tackling secondary you know breakdowns in the secondary special teams might have been the worst first quarter special teams we've seen it was a pretty bad quarter uh as far as like you know giving up a touchdown because you ran into the the, the punter otherwise you're, you're getting the ball back that's pretty bad you know running 10 guys on the field and having to call timeout muffing a punt turnover goes the other way of course usc got the pick afterwards but on that muff punt you also had a personal foul penalty so i mean there was a lot of special teams miscues uh, in that game. But, you know, the offense was so good, I don't think any of that other stuff mattered as much. The the interesting thing about uh, Michael Pittman's, you know, getting over 100 yards and then throwing him that one pass, they got the ball and there was a pass interference. He was three yards short. Yeah. And they got a pass interference and it moved it to the two-yard line. And uh, Stephen Carr runs it in. I was telling Keely, I'm like, yeah. they're going to throw it to him right here. He's going he's gonna to catch it for a touchdown. He's going to have three touchdowns and be a yard short yeah, yeah, of, yeah, being, yeah. of being the, the fourth one. They'll take the guys out or something like that. But, no, he gets over it as well. That's just a tremendous accomplishment, which shows you the depth of this wide receiver group. Um, and that Keaton Slovis moved the ball. I, you, I wasn't as impressed with him. Uh, watching the game as I was when I rewatched the game and saw some of his pocket movement, some of the stuff that I didn't necessarily see while shooting photos and stuff because you know you turn from the quarterback to look at the receivers and yeah. stuff. Uh, but he was was fantastic in the pocket. It's something we we pointed out on film today last week. If you guys didn't get a chance to, to see it, um, and it. it was it was even more prominent in this game than in the Cal game. Uh, just some of the things that he did to create a little bit more time. The offensive line struggled a little bit in the first quarter, I think, with picking up some of the blitzes and stuff. They got better as the game went along, and I think because the run game got better as the game went along mm -hmm. as well. Having Vi back with Stephen Carr uh, more healthy, yeah. you know, to, to both those guys being t together again. You know, Graham Harrell talked about it. He said it was huge. You know, just being able to do more things on the offensive side. You saw last week against Cal, it was Stephen Carr was in there a lot because he was able to pick up. You know, and pass protect. Yep. Now they were able to they were able to to gash them a little bit because you know they were trying to spread out and, and try to defend those wide receivers. It was interesting, and, and we kind of talked about this last Thursday on the show that you know what does UCLA do in their secondary because they're better playing man than yep. zone, but that's just a terrible option against USC. <laughs> and they tried to play man and it didn't work. They tried to play some zone too, and like the the touchdown that uh, Michael Pittman, the second touchdown he caught, I believe that was a zone coverage where he was wide open and Drake London was wide open and Keaton Slovis kind of had his choice. <laughs> Which it, one to throw yeah, to? Yeah, exactly. And it was actually a bad throw, but Michael Pittman, you know, sometimes you <laughs> got to pick your quarterback up. It was a really nice catch and he kind of falls in. It, it was just a, a show of what this offense can be. And, you know, some people have been saying, you know, halfway through the season people were like, Graham Harrell's a fraud. It still was a first year offense. I think it's. I think part of it is it's the maturation of the offense for the totality of the season. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to ask next. When you look at last night's performance, do you attribute it to you know UCLA had the 123rd passing defense in the in the nation, or is this a freshman quarterback finally coming into his own, getting some confidence? A Drake London, a true freshman, also getting confidence, getting guys like you mentioned, Chuck and Vivai Malapai back, so you have some pass protection and a running back role an option how much of that do you look at all of it do you look at it at one what you're saying maturation shotgun what what do you attribute this performance to I think it starts with just the maturation of the offense as a whole because you've seen what they did against that Cal secondary too so it's not like it's just the UCLA secondary it's not like yeah. you're just picking on you know like last year when the offense you know really revved up when they went to, and they played Oregon State 
And you're like, okay, is that a sign of things to come? Because or is it Oregon State? <laughs> because they had made the changes right before that. You know, yeah. they had fired Neil Callaway. That you know, Clay Helton took over the play calling. Like, okay, is that a sign of that, or is it just you're playing a terrible team? I think the fact that you, when you couple the last two weeks together, you know, Keaton Slovis going over. I mean, he's gone over 400. What four of the last five weeks now? Yeah. Um, so it's not just. UCLA's defense is trash, and that's why they were able to to do so well. I think it's showing the progression of him and the offense as a whole. And that, that was kind of my the thing I was kind of wondering. I didn't get a chance to ask Graham Harrell in his uh, his post game, uh, but do you attribute it more to Keaton Slovis and him just getting better, or is it more everyone's getting better? So I did ask Michael Pittman, and he said it's a little bit of both. Um, you you, you got to. You, you got to obviously see that Keaton Slovis has gotten better as the season progressed, you know, from the drop eight stuff that he saw early and how he's made adjustments, how he's moving in the pocket and doing different things. But also Pittman said, you know, sometimes I catch myself running the depth of a route that was in the T Martin offense. And, you know, he said, that's something that all the guys have just had to learn as the season goes on. And when, uh, teams play those zone defenses stuff, finding the right areas, knowing to run to grass, the, the concept that they've talked about, you know, since Graham Harrell's been there. I think all those things have just progressed and progressed, and the offense is showing its capabilities now more to a full extent, especially when they had a full complement of guys, you know, getting those running backs back and being able to do, you know, a little bit more of what they had intended to do throughout the season. And I do think, too, that if you just watch Keaton Slovis, it wasn't like UCLA was – Sitting back there, they got feisty. They were getting after him. What did they get? They ended up with three sacks or something in the game. It they might had have been, three. I think it was three sacks. There was a yeah. lot of times yeah. he was under pressure, and he handled it really well. You know, if you had to take the sack, you take the sack. Yeah. Uh, there was one where he could have maybe thrown it away in the end zone like he did the week before, and, and Clay Helton was very happy that he just threw it away instead of forcing it in there. He didn't force it in. He got he got sacked, but it was fine. You lived you know, to, to fight another day, but a lot of times – he was escaping the pocket. He would get away and still have the vision to see downfield. And that's so important for a quarterback. Sam Darnold had great vision. He was able to escape and find guys downfield. And I think Keen Slovis has some of that too, where he's he's still looking to make a play. And maybe before he was forcing things and you were making a bad decision. And now it's more of, okay, maybe it's the check down. Whatever, you get out, you kind of reset and you assess the situation and you get the ball in a in a place really as quick as you can and i think he's doing a great job of that so it's all i think they're all getting better you know with the year under their belts and the minor thing that i'm wondering at this point of the season that might factor into it is just the confidence level and cuz i talked to Graham Harrell after the Notre Dame game about you know they started to go up tempo and i asked well why and, and and he kept saying that this is offense kind of gets in its head a little bit if it makes a mistake specifically Keaton Slovis where if he made a mistake he kind of got trapped in that mindset of oh i'm making a mistake what i'm going to force it now i'm going to try and do better and so that's why they would go up tempo i wonder how many uh you know you're putting up 400 plus yard performances <laughs> putting getting that under your belt and finding that confidence also attributed to just being more comfortable and making those plays like you said Ryan I think that's true and I think just look at the wide receivers how confident they are and and yep. what Keen Slovis can do watch Tyler Vaughn's touchdown catch did you see it was sort of like this he kind of reached down like almost nonchalantly and caught the ball at the last second I asked him about that he was like I didn't want to give away he didn't want to tell me what the play was he was like but we saw what we thought we would see in there I didn't want to give away that the ball was coming to the DB so he sort of like you know so you have to have a lot of confidence in your ability it's not like oh my god here's the ball He's like, da, da 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 and then he just kind of like nonchalantly catches the touchdown. It's like crazy. So yeah. that one was really well set up because in the third quarter, they had run, I think, two or three outs to him, uh, you know, just perfect throws on the sideline that DBs just had no chance of doing anything with. And that was an out and up. And with Tyler Vaughn's with kind of his, his long neck, when he <laughs> jukes to the outside, you, the DBs think his whole body's going that way. And he just threw his head back and then took off. And Elijah Gates was left behind. And what he was doing was the safety was coming over. And he didn't want the safety to know the ball was in the yeah. air and was closing in on him. So it was a very nonchalant, just whoop, throw yeah. the hands out there real quick. <laughs> so that that's a veteran move right there by Tyler Vaughn's. But, yeah, it is telling you how much confidence is there you in the to. entire offense. That, that they're willing, you know, that everyone's making plays and everyone is is doing their own thing. And one of the things that uh, that Graham Harrell pointed out, he said, you know, it, it's four guys going over 100 yards, which is crazy. But it's two outside guys and two inside guys. Yeah. So it's, you know, they were attacking the entire field because someone asked, you know, was it part of the game plan to attack the middle of the field as much? And, you know, they did, but it was just seeing what was there. And that's the way this offense is ideally supposed to run. And, you know, it, it was going on full tilt, you know, yesterday. UCLA really couldn't stop 
uh, USC's offense, even when USC's offense was trying to get in its own way sometimes with, you know, with a couple sacks early or with the penalties that they would have, a lot of times those have been the things that have stopped them in the past. You know, the, the Oregon and the Arizona State game, we talked about how they didn't finish drives, and yeah. it would be one penalty that set them back, and they'd end up four yards. they get fourth and four when they had a five-yard penalty throw it off. This game, it didn't matter. They were picking up everything. I think there was one of them was, you know, they got a 15-yard penalty, hands to the face, down in the red zone. Didn't matter. Still got in. That was the Michael Pittman touchdown. It was like first and 25 or something, and, yeah. then, and then they end up scoring a touchdown. You're like, that's, you know, that's rare. You do that. <laughs> Now, on the other side of the ball, I know USC's defense was proud of the fact that they their goal coming into the game was limiting Joshua Kelly to under 1,000 yards on the season. They were able to do that, but Dorian Thompson-Robinson kind of had his way with USC's defense yeah. a little bit. 35 points were scored. It was essentially a shootout, shootout at one point of the game. What do you take away from this defensive performance? Yeah, I mean, DTR, uh, he, had a, I mean, he had a really great night there. I mean, 367 yards passing, three touchdowns, uh, I think one pick uh, he had there after the turnover on the muff punt. He, he gained 93 yards rushing. I ended up with like 64 because some of the sacks, but... I mean, he was taken off and running the ball. I mean, they really had a hard time containing him. I get it, but, you know, you see the video afterwards where they're excited about keeping Joshua Kelly to 45 yards. It just seemed like, well, yeah, that's fine, but you also let DTR go absolutely bonkers on you. I don't know if that's something you want to, like, be, like, cheering about. You know what I mean? If Joshua Kelly would have ran for 115 last year instead of, what, 279 or whatever it was, yeah. then I, I think you would look more at that. I think that's why they were so psyched about it because – that was something that was mentioned several times during this week in, in yeah. the oh, locker yeah. room and in meetings and stuff about that Joshua Kelly. And that's a record in this in the rivalry, uh, which I didn't necessarily know, but they were, they were saying it on the broadcast. I think it was the most any uh, any running backs ever got against USC, too. I think it was, I heard it was the second most. Or second most, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So maybe Kenyon Barner probably is up there. Yeah, I think he might have had 300, yeah. <laughs> in that 61 52 game, I think it was. <laughs> um, but this, this game kind of felt like it might have that feel. But the defense got the stops late that it needed to get. Uh, you know, I think that's the important thing because it felt like it might end up like that Oregon-USC uh, game back then yeah. where it was just both teams were scoring back and forth. And you felt halfway through the third quarter, the USC fans, like it felt in the stadium, like the USC fans were just like, oh, no, unless we get a turnover, this game's over because we're never going to stop them. Yeah. You know, we're going to keep scoring too, but we're, they were, I think they were 17 behind in that one too, and they kept getting it at 10 and couldn't get over the hump. And that's what I felt like felt like in this game was for UCLA. They were like, okay, we scored, yeah, but we're not going to stop them at all. And when, it, when it got from 24 to 10, I think people kind of got worried. But yeah. then it kept going back and forth, 10, 17, 10, 17. But to go 24 to 10, you're like, uh-oh, this is not going the right direction. Yeah. And I think that, that UCLA did a good job of picking on the linebackers. You know, Kanai Malga got matched up in man coverage, and that's what it seemed like a lot. Now I have to look a little bit more intently. I just With kinda, that Devin Asiasi kind of Yeah, thing. I glanced pretty quickly at the game today, uh, but it seemed like a lot of those throws over the middle to the tight ends were on the, the – was man-to-man -man coverage with the linebackers. So uh, maybe it was – there was some zone coverage and stuff there, but – it seemed like that that was a matchup they went for a little bit more. USC, you know, Felton had six for 50. That was a guy they were really keying on. They were keying on Felton. They were keying on Joshua Kelly. They did shut down the two guys they were keying on. Yeah. Now, you still gave up 35 points. But when you're scoring 52, it's okay. Yeah, Kyle <laughs> Phillips, 12 for 123. Like, that's, you know. Now, he had seven in the first quarter. <laughs> For like, for like, so they slowed him down later. Yeah. For like eighty or something. That's why Talanoa had so many tackles because he was tackling that guy all the time. <laughs> Eighteen tackles for Talanoa Funga. That Ridiculous. Was, I saw it after the game. I was just, I was like flipping through the book and I was like, eighteen? What, what? So that's the most uh, for a USC player since Troy Palomalu back in '01, I believe. Yeah. So it's just yeah. crazy because that was the day that Palomalu got honored and yeah. was also Talanoa's favorite player, USC player. So. Kind of interesting. And a guy from Oregon, like there yeah. was a lot of parallels and stuff there. Yeah. So interesting. Having so. Troy in the building was special for a lot of people. You know, Taylor Mays tweeted out that you know yeah. getting to see him. Viani Talamavio said it was his favorite player. Yeah. You know, so it, Troy doesn't come around the program very often. Usually, just when he's being honored. He's for pretty quiet, dude. Yeah. Another, another yeah. award. Very low key, which is fun. But it was it was fun to see that he was you know he broke down the the safeties huddle before the game and stuff. So yeah. you know he's not a very active guy like that. Like some of the guys like Keyshawn Johnson or anything. But when he was there, it was cool to see that he made an impact on, you know, not only the current group, but some of the former players as well. Yeah. We know Taylor pretty well because, you know, he does the show and everything. He's not a huge social media guy. So for him to, like, somehow got a picture of himself and tweeted it out with, he, like, 
He's very excited about that, Troy. He had, to, he had to think about doing that, like something that's not really on the it top of his mind. It was premeditated. Okay. So, so that means it was a big deal. Yes. Um, but overall, Ryan, I'm going to go to you first. Okay. USC Zane 4. And I know, it, I didn't rewatch the broadcast, but I know that people were saying that they were very uh, Clay Helton friendly. I know Molly McGrath was was advocating for Clay Helton. I know a lot of USC fans were scared that if you had, if USC had a finish like they did in the season, it would be harder for maybe something to happen to Clay Helton. What's your feel on his job security going forward? What's going to happen in the next couple of weeks, do you think? So we're going there, huh? Okay. Wait. Where, well, where do you want to go? That's no, that's that's where we got it. That's where everyone wants to go. <laughs> uh, and so eight four is not good enough. Um, so over the past two years, you know, going five and seven, eight and four, you're you're twelve and eleven, right? For the last two, is that is that correct? Is my math right? Twelve and eleven. Um, no. What was it? What were they? Eight and four. Eight so and four, five and seven. Okay. Math, math. math. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you're twelve and eleven. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You are an engineer, so I was I, like, I'm getting confused. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm trusting you with the math. So <laughs> you have the number four roster in the country, definitely the best roster in the Pac-12 over the last two years, and you're barely above 500. That's not good enough. Eight and four after five and seven isn't good enough. Backing in, even if if Utah loses, which they're not going to do, to the Pac-12 <laughs> championship game isn't good enough. Like you should win the South. I think Utah's a good team. You beat Utah. You should win the South. Washington's not very good. They're six and five. Uh, BYU is not very good. Um, Notre Dame has shown that they're they're not that great, and USC, USC actually played pretty well against Notre Dame. And Oregon ends up losing to ASU uh, on Saturday night, and that's uh, I mean that's crazy stuff. So USC was talented enough to at least win ten games. Eight and four to me isn't good enough. You needed to make more changes. You can't come this year. Well, now we're going to change our defensive style and now we're going to change our special teams and stuff like those are things you should have done a year or two ago which if you were advertising the notre dame rebuild yes that's what that involved so if you're going to come back this season and say that you're actually going to do the full notre dame but just <laughs> yeah. delayed we're doing notre dame in sense? increments like just yeah. small increments <laughs> and like we're actually going to tackle a practice this year now like now we finally get it like no I, it's it's great we all love clay helton he's been a uh, joy to cover and He's a nice guy. I know some people hate it when you say, oh, he, he's but whatever. He's been, you know, nice to us. He's been accommodating. He's never said anything bad that we know about us. We, you know, it's well. maybe behind closed doors. But, the, you know, for, he's been great, but it's time. Uh, Rosh Markazi wrote about this. Uh, it's it's time to move on. He was, you know, you could argue or not that he was the right coach at the time. Um, none of that matters now because that time's over. Now it's time to go into a different direction. So, Beating a a uh, four and seven UCLA team should not be the the mark of yes. That means he should come back for another year. You can't keep doing this incremental stuff. It's time to move on. You got to rip the bandaid off and go in another direction. Will they do that? It's hard to say because USC is still alive in the Pac-12 South race technically. Um, my guess, my gut, and this is not inside information, is if they do something, I, I kind of think they will. It will be after, like next you know, a week from today, like a Sunday, after Utah wins, USC finishes eight and four. Will not, um, you know, play in the Pac-12 championship game. Most likely, Utah will not be going to the college football playoff because Oregon lost and they don't get a great win in the Pac-12 championship game. It could happen, but a lot of things have to go right. USC ends up in the Holiday Bowl. To me, just not good enough. So my my theory is is one your decision shouldn't be determined by someone else's game. I, I talked about this. I don't remember what show it was on, but I, feud podcast. I went, I went off on this. It's like, that's he the did. dumbest thing ever. Like, well, we're going to keep or not keep someone based on what someone in another state does. What? No, it doesn't matter. You should know what, what, whether you have succeeded as a program or you have not, not based on someone else. Like, Oh, we backed into something. Yeah. So that's success. No, it's not. I think it just, it might be optics where if yeah. you know, and it's that's not. that's what I argued back. Yeah. Cause I think even if, if Utah somehow loses to Colorado and they, Colorado just won, they beat Washington, but this is going to be in Salt Lake city and Utah is a buzzsaw right now. So they are not, they are focused on smashing Colorado. Like that, you know, Kyle Whittingham was asking at the college football playoff. He, it was like after the win, he's like, Nope, we're going to, you know, beat the crap out of Colorado. So I think that's going to happen. But more of the optics, I, I believe. But yeah, if if the if I don't care, the, it doesn't matter about optics to me. I think it's dumb that you you're concerned about optics. Either know your decision or don't know your yeah. decision. Not base it on what someone else is. I, and, I think hey, it looks better this way. Fair point. Now, now I will say my theory is that if there's not a decision, there's not an announcement tomorrow. Like I, it, you either announce yes he's coming back or we're making a move. Should be done tomorrow. 
your regular season's over, you have a month or whatever before the bowl game, a decision should be made tomorrow or announced tomorrow is what I would do because of recruiting. Yes. So one way or the other, because if you're saying he's coming back, then the staff needs to have that stability to go out and be able to recruit and tell all these recruits, hey, look, we're coming back. They've already announced whatever, rather than everyone being like, I don't, I, I still don't know what's going on there. So if they do not make an announcement tomorrow, one way or the other, that tells me that they are concerned about either concerned about optics or actually considering what happens in that Utah game to be the determinant. Yeah, that, I think you know, great points. I think that's all fair. Um, I'm not sure. What's I don't know if that's, that, the, the, if that's a good idea or not. The but awards I'm just dinner, saying that's that's. I yeah. think that's the that's my theory of if there's not an announcement tomorrow. I think they're looking at that Utah game. The, the real quick, the awards dinner was tonight, so they moved it up. We talked about that. Yes. Um, so we're not allowed in there, but you know we have people that we know that are that were there. Yogi Roth was the uh, MC of things. They had it over at the Coliseum, in the suites in the new scholarship tower. Uh, Michael Pittman got the. MVP, MVP, USC did send out the uh, list of awards. I don't think people really care a lot about those, but... Do you want me to run down them really quickly? <laughs> Since I don't, they don't Do care. It. Do it. Uh, most inspirational was John Houston. Trojan Way Leadership Award was Amon Ross St. Brown. Trojan Commitment Award was Christian Rector. Lyman of the Year were, was Elijah Vera Tucker and J. Tufele. Perimeter Players of the Year, Tyler Vons, Talano Hufunga, and Isaiah Polamau. Special Teams Player of the Year, Chase McGrath. Service Team Players of the Year, uh, or walk-ons and <laughs> player of the game versus UCLA was Keen Lewis. Sorry, walk-ons. Uh, Sean Mahoney, Scott Voigt, Matt Bale, and Grant Jones. So there you go. Uh, and, and that will be it for me. And MVP, obviously, Michael Pittman. Yeah, congratulations to him. I already said it. I wanted thought. to say congratulations to congratulations him. Congratulations to Michael Pittman, the uh, Bolitnikoff Award uh, semifinalist. And so we were told that there was nothing um, groundbreaking. Like Mike Bone didn't walk in and go, congratulations, guys, but we're making a move. Like nothing like that happened. There was positive talk from the speakers about the future of the program with Clay Helton. I know that's probably not going to, that's what people want to hear. But at least for tonight's awards dinner, there wasn't any talk of making a change. It was about the future, and it was about Clay Helton at that dinner. Now, could Why there be an? Why would there be though? Why would you be like, let's celebrate the season? Oh, by the way, you know, it seems like no, you yeah. have to cap it. Like, I, we don't a, know what's going to happen. It's a bookend, if you will. Yeah. Uh, well, I think if it if you had conversation the other way, it's like just want to let you guys know this is what's going to happen in a positive manner for Clay Helton. Then I think that could have come out of tonight much more than. Hey, we're going in a different direction. Right. There wasn't an announcement of, you know, he's signing an extension or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. There wasn't anything like that. Now, but. this was a concept that Taylor Mays brought up in our last show, but how much does movement in, at the head coaching position matter on the potential replacement? If you don't have someone that's worth it, would you want to just keep Clay Helton around and then see what happens next season? How much, how much do those outside variables matter rather than, just making the decision based off the play of the team and whatnot. Yeah, I, I think you're talking if, you know, if you can't get Urban Meyer, is it is it worth switching out? I think at this point you're you know the level of kind of mediocrity you have and you know, a PJ Fleck or a Matt Campbell would be an upgrade over I, I mean they would be an upgrade over Clay Helton, just to be honest. I mean, I, I think you'd rather get someone like Urban Meyer. Um, but if you if you're getting someone else that's more of the up and comer that's Done well at a couple different programs, had some big wins on their resume. I think you know you're you're probably better off there. But you, I think you still have to go after the big names. You know, it could be a you know a James Franklin or Urban Meyer or whatever it is. And but I, yeah, I don't think it's worth it to bring back another year. The the kind of purgatory that the program is in right now, it's terrible for recruiting. It's just the, the fan base, the fans just can't stand it. Like they are ready to just jump off cliffs. They're done. So I don't think you can afford as a program to bring Clay Helton back. Honestly, my my thought is that it's a it's going to be a financial risk assessment. So I've got three categories. So bear with me. There's a little bit of an explanation here, but okay, three categories, and it's it's all about financial risk assessment. So one, if you if you fire Clay Helton, whether or not there's a buyout, you have to pay the rest of the contract. You have to pay all the contracts of the assistants. If there's a buyout, you have to pay that as well. So you have to pay all those things. And a new coaching staff. So one category is you're paying all of Helton's guys to go away. You're bringing in the high-end guy, the Urban Meyer, the James Franklin, and the money that it costs to pay for them. Now, you also, when you do that, if you bring those guys in, you get more booster support. You get more people season tickets. 
So there's one column. The second column is you, you get rid of Helton. You bring in a lesser name. You bring in Mike Norvell. You know, someone that's not going to excite the fan base. It might be a good move in the long run. Even a P.J. Fleck. You know, somebody like that that fans, the common fan maybe doesn't know much about. And, you know, it, is it going to excite them? Are they immediately going to re-up their season tickets? Or, you know, is a booster going to – you know, because when you make one of these type of moves, you have to go to the boosters and say, hey, I need – I need you to write this much check yeah. to help help out with this. That's what happens in these type situations. Are they going to be like, yeah, let's do that. Let's go for it. Or are they going to feel like you've asked me this when you wanted Steve Sarkeesian. You asked me this when you wanted to get rid of so-and-so. When you wanted to get rid of Lane. Like, so is there a little bit of a, you know, a, a fatigue factor with that to be determined? So those are two categories. The third category is you keep Helton. And we've already heard from so many people that they're not interested in Helton coming back as yeah. far as fan and fan support. So as far as the dollars that come with that, with ticket sales, with people at the stadium, with boosters potentially, you know, how much money are you losing there um, if you bring him back, but that you're not having to pay out as far as contracts and getting someone up. So I think those are three columns. Sure. And I think it becomes a financial risk assessment to – just to a, a large point uh, here, because I don't know that they're, you know, Mike Bone has been told that he can come in, hey, you have a blank check, blank slate, do whatever you want, we'll pay for whatever you want. I just don't feel like that's the case at USC. I don't think that's been the case for a while, and maybe it's because of the power struggles that are behind closed doors, you know, and maybe it's a little bit of a, a lot of things, but I think it ends up coming down to financial that financial risk assessment, and it's in one of those three columns, and how do you figure out you know, which column is going to be best for you, the USC football program going forward? See, I think that third column is what's dangerous, is that USC did win five of their last six, and it was USC-UCLA in a smaller coliseum that only holds 77,000 people. They announced like 64,000 in the attendance, and there is no way there was that many people there. It was, they're speaking, you know, that the fans are speaking by what you're seeing out there, USC and UCLA, and you know UCLA won three or four, USC had won uh, you know four or five, and you still couldn't you know you still had a two thirds full coliseum uh, for that game, which is unacceptable. And and the recruits are saying that, that they're probably speaking the loudest. And we had a Periscope. Someone asked me, really, is this um, is USC really number seventy seven in the country? I didn't check today, but that's there have been no new commits. They're probably right in that area. 77 according to the 24-7 sports composite, which takes all the recruiting rankings into consideration, and 11th in the Pac-12. And that's, uh, that's a real problem. Even UCLA has been getting some good recruits. Mm -hmm. Colorado has been on fire. They've been picking up recruits. Um, you know, transfers, everything like that. USC just isn't in that position. People are letting everyone know this isn't the future. This isn't the way you want the program to go. And you're, it's pretty loud and clear when you just look at all the signs of what's going on. I think Mike Bone sees all those things. That's got to come into his, you know, the consideration when you, if you want to keep them or not. But I think that column three is where USC is going to be the do the worst. It would be the most dire financially for the program. Can't you see a scenario though where it's argued, where it's people are going to try and look at the season as its own thing when evaluating Clay Helton and say, hey, he bounced back from five and seven. He did it with a backup quarterback. There were so many injuries, et cetera, et cetera. Can't you see a scenario where that gets thrown into the answer as well as and. He's told me that he will find new avenues for defensive coordinator and special teams coordinator yeah. or something. Can't you see something like that happening? Tweet at Keeley is my name for all your complaints on that one. No. Um, you can, this is not in a vacuum. You have to take in the whole thing into consideration. And everyone plays freshman. I mean, it's college football now. People are playing freshman. Guys get hurt. You beat Utah with your number three guy. Because of the roster USC has, you look at the talent composite, they have more talent than everybody. Even if you get some guys hurt, they have more talent. No one could do the kind of stuff that USC does because of all the built-in advantages. You should be head and shoulders above everyone in the Pac-12 South, at least. And USC isn't. And that's two years in a row. To not win the Pac-12 South this year, I think Utah's a really good team. You'll beat them, though. Like You, you can beat them with your third-string quarterback. You should win the Pac-12, and you're not. So I, I think that there could be arguments made for that. We've seen... You know, I guess Bob Greasy and uh, was it no? Uh, is it Bob Levy and uh, Steve Levy? Steve, and Steve Levy and uh, Brian Greasy. And Brian Greasy. Sorry, I, I haven't rewatched the uh, broadcast, but man, people were really hating on it. Like the the kind of Helton love fest, people were tweeting at us and posting on the message board. But you can't look at this season in a vacuum. Yeah, they they got some guys banged up. 
the roster is too talented to lose 11 games over the last two seasons. That's the bottom line for me. Makes sense. Um, let's actually go. We have a full call queue, so let's go Sweet. to that. Unless we want to add any comments. I'm sure we'll have more about what happens next for the Trojan football program. But let's actually go to our first caller. Hello, you are live on Tunnel Vision. Hey, guys. This is Darren from Reno, Nevada. Um, you guys kind of touched on it earlier uh, with – just Keaton's efficiency lately and how he's been delivering the ball. And even with all the stats and numbers, something that stuck out to me is his ability to throw the football when he's about to get hit. Um, it happened in Utah when he got hurt. And then a couple times over the past couple weeks, he's been delivering some really pretty balls when he's about to get hit. And I just wondered, is that something that JT was able to do last year? I don't really remember him doing it um, or anything like that. I don't want to, about to start a quarterback comparison here on who's going to start next year. But is that something JT was able to do also next year that you guys can remember? Hey, thanks, Darren. I mean, thanks, Darren. it's so hard to compare last year to this year with the offense. They're just so different. It's yeah. such much, it's much more of a quarterback friendly offense now. Uh, I don't remember JT doing that a lot in the first half of the Fresno State game, but I don't think that it was necessary. I, I mean, I think what he's asking is basically when there's pressure in his face, was he still delivering good balls? And I think that Keaton does a much better job better job of that. But I think it also – the reason why is it goes back to your point that it's a different offense. And I think that there's just that much more confidence in the simplicity of this offense yeah. and knowing where guys are going to be. I mean, like the, the throw to Drake London, that's a – you know the 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 not the touchdown, but the one before that. You know the, the deep ball, the, vi, the touchdown run after it. Yes, yeah. one of those. Yeah, um, it was the Drake Leonard that set up the Vi touchdown. Yes, okay. the, the, you know he puts a lot of air under that ball, but it's because he he sees early that he has man to man coverage. He recognizes it. He knows that he has a safety on that side. So part of it is recognition on Keaton Slovis's part. But it's just he knows where those guys are going to be, and he can see if there's one safety on this side of the field. That's going to be, you know, there's going to be a lot of space out there. So we can throw that one high and just let it go and get rid of it right before the guy gets there. I think that it's just the comfortability that he has in this in this offense versus JT last year feeling like he was, you know, running away from yeah. stuff at all times and the offense wasn't getting anyone ever open. Like, like Keaton has, you know, even when he has, you know, quick pressure, there's a lot of times where he steps away from the first guy and there's somebody wide open. open. Yeah, yeah. And, but this and, offense is built on getting the ball out quickly, too, so that helps yeah, as compared that, to the gumbo. Just, But just when there is pressure, I just feel like when he avoids that first guy, there's often so, – like, there'll be a short guy, but he'll be wide open or there'll be a check down. If you remember that one of the – the throws that the coaches will commend him for was a third down play in the red zone, and he just checks the ball down to Stephen Carr, went through his options. I think he made somebody miss or you know just moved away in the pocket, and Carr's there for a quick, easy dump down, and he picks up 14 yards or something. It was yeah. like a third and seven. And those are type plays that just never felt like they were there for JT. Like the easy throws, the no. you know the guys wide open. It felt like you got to thread it through the needle type of thing. And you know I, I think that every once in a while there'd be a guy – run wide open. 95% of the throws, though, were, you know, there's someone covered up. And yeah. with the receivers they have, okay, you can still do that. But I think this offense just made it that more simple for the quarterback. So even when there's pressure coming, he can feel confident in making that throw instead of maybe double clutching that last second, just hesitating just a, a hair just to make sure that guy's open and there's not someone free coming. So I, I think that plays a lot into it. Yeah, I think Slovis said in the post-game pressure that all of us in the media could have thrown for 100 yards with those wide receivers. So, <laughs> so, so JT probably would have been okay too. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> if we could do it, then you know I'm yeah. assuming that the highly trained quarterback could as well. True. Thanks for the call. Let's go to our next caller in the queue. Hello, <laughs> you are live on Tunnel Vision. Hey guys, what's going on? It's John from Glendora. Hey John. Uh, quick thing, I just want to, uh, hey guys, uh, I just really want to touch base on, I don't see how you can fire him at an 8 and 4 season. I know it's USC and I know you should do a lot better than 8 and 4, but with the cards that are dealt and the fan base, how it is, um, just get behind the team. I feel like if we just get behind the team, behind the coach, we'll get better recruits and we'll move on from there. Hey, John, thanks for the terrible take. I'm just kidding. Thank, no, thanks for the call. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, there are, there are definitely fans that are that are like John that are just like, hey, you know, it's all right. He's our guy. And um, I mean, that's fine. Like, uh, you know, there's definitely some people that feel that way. 
I think it's a minuscule minority. It is a minuscule. Yes. Um, the to you, John, I think, and a lot of people for that that feel that way. The bar has been lowered quite a bit, and to talk about, hey, we almost got the Pac-12 South championship. That's not a thing. Like that's not that doesn't. You don't get a banner for that. That's not what your site should be seeing. When you see, you have this stockpile of talent that nobody else in the conference has. I need a good food analogy. Okay. So you're on uh, Chopped or something like that. You're always on Chopped. Everyone's uh, on Chopped. It's a great show, chopped. guys. It's a great show. Yeah, it is a great and show. It, you, but we're at, like, me and Shotgun are on Chopped, and we have different baskets. And my basket has like escargot and like fresh shrimp and scallops and, uh, you know, filet mignon and all the spices I could possibly want. I have this amazing basket. And so I get to cook and I get two hours. And Shotgun has a basket that has snail shells in there and uh, some moldy bread. And uh, durian, yeah, <laughs> uh, pack of Doritos. It's half eaten, and uh, the tops of a lot of Oreos. Like that's what he has to make a dinner with, and we both make our dinners, and he only gets an hour, and his is better than mine, or very close to mine. Are you going to say, well, you guys were close? Like you, you know, you sh I should stick around. Like no, I'm a bad <laughs> chef. I had all these great ingredients, and I couldn't beat Shotgun with his snail shells and half Oreos. So to me, that's what USC is doing here. USC has so many resources. They had so much talent stockpiled. I mean, who can beat the number five, six team in the country with your third string quarterback? Because you got all these great receivers and stuff. Now, Cleveland gets some credit for putting, you know, putting those, you know, that roster together. But you're seeing the recruiting fall off a cliff. Historic levels we've never seen before. And USC for two years in a row, losing 11 games total, like th that cannot happen. So <laughs> I just uh, respectfully disagree with your take, John, on that one. I just wanted to add, I think John seemed to suggest that if fans got behind the team, then recruits would find USC a more attractive place to go. What recruits are looking for is player development, and they know what happens like behind the scenes. They can they get a sense for these things. So it's it's about what they're seeing on the field, where they're seeing guys going. It's about the NFL guy who is going to that level. So I, I don't think it's really about like, oh, the fans are happier. I'm going to go to this place. You know, I don't think it, it correlates. Yeah. So. And, and I, I think maybe at the Randall Troy people are talking about some of the player development. All these freshmen come in. And it's like, I don't know if that's really player development. If they're freshmen. It's like, that's kind of where they are. And you're, you're, you know, you're coaching them up a little bit. But hmm. they're, they're pretty darn talented when they come into the program. But look you know? at the progress that Keenan Slovis has made. He's made pro – I mean, uh, yeah. I and, think there's definitely been a lot more player development this season. Yes. And I mean, you can I think point to the Grant freshmen. Harrell's got a lot of that to you know. To you can do point to the freshmen, but you can also point to guys like Isaiah Polamau from the middle of the year to the end of the year or John Houston from the middle of the year to the end of the year. These are veteran guys. You don't expect them to take a, you know, a, a big step forward in the second half of the season. And it, I feel like uh, some of those guys have done that. So I think the development's there. I think the position coaches that were brought in have done a good job. Mm -hmm. um, but just overall – the, the questions are stability and development. There's two parts of that yeah. with recruits. That's the two things that high-end recruits want. And the stability is still – it's been a big question for a year and a half now. You know, so I think that that's where you're having a big issue with recruiting. Development is getting better. But is it at the same level as a Clemson or Alabama? I wouldn't say that. You know, you, mm -hmm. wouldn't, you wouldn't say that, hey, the defensive line prospects look like the defensive line prospects at – no, at one of those schools, and you know they're all similarly rated guys that are on those defensive lines. Even though I think USC's defensive lines played really well at times, yeah. um, so I, I think that that's you know that's something you're looking at there. Yep. Looking at the yeah, so 11 in the Pac-12, and if you look at like the, the player rankings um, by state, so say oh let's go to which state are we in? We're in California, so we'll just you know pull us up on 24/7 Sports. You can do this too. Uh, is the number one player in California going to USC? No. Number two? No. Three? No. Four? No. Five? No. Six? No. All the way down to 25 is where the first play. This is not in the country. This is in the state of California. The top 24 players, as of now, are not going to USC. This is USC. The, what, they just sweep up California and usually get four of the top 10 or more. And I, I did ch charts on this before. This is as bad of recruiting as we've ever seen. This is bad for Oregon State recruiting. There's not, not a lot on USC. So, yeah, John, I'm sorry. And I know some people on uh, Periscope are saying we're destroying John. Not Don't mean to destroy you, but it's it's not like, oh, yeah, things are okay. Like, eh, you know, if you think this is okay, and th then I don't think your expectations are high enough for USC football. 
Um, did you, Ryan, did you see the tweet from, uh, who was it from? I think the solid verbal that said, if your team hasn't gone, um, 11 and one in the last 10 years, then you should change your expectations of, uh, for the program. Yeah, I didn't agree with that tweet either. Um, I mean, that, that's probably our buddy Dan Rubenstein, who's an Oregon fan. He doesn't want, so uh, Harvey Hyde, we talked about this on the show. Harvey Hyde asked a lot of people from fans of UCLA, Cal, whatever, what would you rather USC do? What do you think they said? They want USC to keep Clay Helton. They don't want them to bring someone who's really good in because it's a sleeping giant and USC can do well. So yes, that might be Dan who's just kind of like, yeah, I'd rather not see USC bring in a real coach. Um, Interesting. Well, let's go to our next call. We love, we love those guys. It's all over. In the queue. I believe it is Jeff. Hello. You're live on tun Tunnel Vision. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Uh, this is Jeff in Texas. The reason I'm calling just, first off, y'all do such a great job. So kudos to y'all. But Thanks, Jeff. I felt like yesterday for ESPN's coverage from college game day in the morning to the broadcast in the afternoon, and then even Oregon and Arizona State, it almost seemed like it was like an agenda-driven purpose to bring up how great they think Clay Helton is. And it felt like everyone from Herb Street to Molly McGrath and Steve Levy and Greasy just talking about how great Clay Helton was, how great Clay Helton was. And I just wanted to see what y'all's thoughts on that was, just kind of get an idea if y'all saw that and what you think, I mean, the reason behind it. It just felt like it was almost – driven by someone telling them to do that. I, that's interesting. And we've heard, I think, uh, you know, Ryan Karji from the LA Times is saying like, hey, you know, we're not, you know, if you write something that's positive about Clay Helton, it doesn't mean you're like, you know, advocating for it or paying it. But I, I haven't rewatched the broadcast. I saw the Molly McGrath tweets. I've seen Herb Street really go to bat for uh, Clay Helton over, you know, the last several weeks on, on college game day. Um, some of that too is, if Clay Helton's talking to you, if, if Clay Helton and Herbie are talking and he could be a source, do you want to protect the source a little bit? I mean, maybe there's some stuff like that. I don't think there's like an ESPN agenda to keep Clay Helton around. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't think something like that's happening, but there's personal relationships in all this. And we all have good relationships with Clay Helton, but we're just trying to be objective and tell you like, hey, you know, and you want to feel bad for Clay? He's going to get more money than we'll all see in our lifetimes. You know what I mean? That's, you know, he's going to be fine. But we're just trying to call it like we see it, where it just doesn't look like the program is going the direction that it needs to go. Um, but I, I don't think there's some kind of agenda out there, but there's definitely there definitely was a lot of that. And I don't know if they see Herb Street doing that, so they're going to try to like get in good favor with him and agree with him. I'm not sure how that all went down, but it's kind of interesting. When you're covering from a national perspective, so during college baseball season, I cover the West Coast. Um, so you root for the coaches that are – that are friendly, that are open, that are going, that give you access, you know, that are, that are great. Like college baseball is so much different than college football for me because I need something. I text or I call a coach and it's great. You know, I can't just call up Clay Helton and be like, Hey, can you, you know, like I'll, I need a velocity on a pitcher. I'll text the coach. Hey, can you give me, you know, what his change up was? What a, simple, small things like that. That's when you're a national crew and you come in to do the broadcast, you sit down with the coaches and, you know, some coaches, do you remember Chris Peterson? Do you remember the, the whole thing with the, yeah. oh, they put the cupcakes up there as their schedule, yeah. and Chris Peterson was like, I'm not meeting with them? You know, even though it's a required thing of the broadcast that you meet, I usually the, is it the yeah, day before it's usually or two like days Thursday ago? or Friday, like Friday they would yeah. meet, yeah. And, and if he says, nope, I'm not meeting with the crew, it, it makes their jobs a lot harder. Yeah. yeah, so that's where you get background information. You know, the, they're raving, you know, with this the in this broadcast, the, the parts of it that I was listening to, they're raving about Talanoa Hufunga. And, you know, uh, Chip Kelly was saying he's the, the, the biggest key of their defense. And then they start talking about how, you know, when Talanoa Hufunga's been injured, that's when USC's lost games this season. And so that information comes from speaking to the coaches. You know, it's a lot easier to speak to the coach and, you know, them tell you what they've seen on film than to be a national broadcast crew, helicopter in, have to yeah. watch five games of tape yourself and make your own decisions rather than getting some extra information from the coaches, like, okay, watch for this guy. And then if I go and I want to watch some extra tape, that guy stands out a lot, definitely, because yeah. I'm looking for him rather than something else. So it helps – it makes the job so much easier when coaches are just kind of open with you and, and kind of, you know, give you information about how the team's been playing previously. You know, it, it, for me as in the college baseball, I may not see Santa Clara but once a season or whatever random smaller school it is. 
So when I go to see them, I, you know, I need to be filled in on the whole. I can go through the box scores. I can look at the stats. But that, those things don't tell the whole story. So it's great for the coaches to kind of give you that information, to, to give you that insight as to how the program has been, how the season's been progressing, how the program's been going. And, you know, that's the type of thing that Clay Helton does. And that's why he's, he's extremely friendly and helpful with the media. And that's why a lot of people, I think, go to bat for him. I don't know for sure if there's any other, you know, greater reason for it but i think that's a lot of it you know yeah if if the lady he's good at the politics stuff. yeah i mean he's well, you know, not even the politics stuff coach just being, bone and like giving him the well, ball just being a nice person he goes a long way but he you yeah. know it, i don't want to say like you know he's he's friendly to the people that he should be friendly with his bosses things like that he's uh you know very you know accommodating i think there's some political aspect to it so he he could probably be a pretty good politician and he you know, probably sells it to the broadcast crew as well. And they all, hey, this guy's great. He said something nice about my kid, whatever. Like, if I want you, him to stick around. If you're in a neighborhood and you have an old lady that lives across the street and she's a complete curmudgeon and you hate her versus you have the nicest old lady across the street, someone starts to break into her car late at night and you're like, man, do I really want to get up and do something about this <laughs> wow, or not? Wow, shotgun. That's kind of... That's, that's a, a horrible That's an analogy. extreme version. That's an extreme version, but I that's what it is. I would still help the, the curmudgeon lady, but that's okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. justice is justice no matter what, shotgun. See, you can call are not easy. You can so. call 911 either, either time, but you know whether you're going to get up there and actually go and risk yourself for it, True. Okay. Now you know how to be on shotgun side. You got to go on this good side. But okay, I think this also speaks to my point about the broad view of the Clay Helton era versus the the detailed version of the Clay yeah. Helton era, especially this season. Molly McGrath doesn't have time to know that no. special teams it's puts a out ten guys view. every time. I would say it's more of a surface. And her view, tweet yeah. showed that it, there's injuries. Keen Slovis got injured, or I mean, JT Daniels got injured, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, if you look at it from that broad of a view, you're going to be like, yeah, it's better, et cetera, et cetera. So. It's multifaceted. How about that? Yeah. But thanks for the call. But that's a very common complaint, man. There was a lot of people that were not happy with the way uh, people were doing, you know, they didn't like the LA Times doing things, but then the LA Times wrote a couple columns about it's time to move on. But the national perspective, man, the fans were not happy from what I've seen. Uh, Let's go to our next caller in the queue. Hello, you're live on Tunnel Vision. How you doing? Yes, this fella, 007211. I was calling to see if Clay Helton stays, does the recruiting class get better knowing that he know how to close on National Signing Day as far as getting recruits? What, um, do the numbers get better? And do recruits still want to even consider USC knowing that he would stay? Because the players never quitted on him this year. And I commend the players for that at the Trojans fan. Yeah, thanks. Double, double, was it 007? 11, 211. 211. I like James that. James Bond. Um, I think it, the recruiting class can't get worse. It's going to get better. Uh, wh- how much better is the problem? Like, I, you know, the worst class we've ever seen was last year, 20th. And you could argue that it was really more like 14th because Brew McCoy and Chris Steele came in late. And some of the three-star dudes are, end up being studs. So it's probably, if you re-ranked it, it would probably be better. But you're talking like from 20 to 70 cents. Like, we've never seen outside like the top 10 almost ever. To be 20th is a big step. I don't think Clay Helton stays, you get close to 20th. I mean, you're probably top 50 or top 40, but I don't think you're going to get – and so the, by far the worst class. Yeah, there, there's several recruits. There, there's guys that really like Helton and are hoping he stays on, on the recruiting trail as well, but they want to wait and see that that happens before making their decision uh, because, you know, maybe they don't fit in if someone comes in and runs the wing tee, you know, versus the, the offense that USC's in. So that – that's something that is going to change whenever a decision is finally made. The sooner you can make it, whether it's to keep him or to get rid of him, the sooner the better, which is why if I was in a position, I would make an announcement tomorrow for USC. You know, that, that just because you either give that, that staff currently <clears throat> that, much, that extra week or two weeks or whatever it is until you're going to, if they do make an announcement, if, it, if you don't just yeah, put them I mean, in purgatory yeah. the entire time, that is an option. That's not that would not another be a smart year of option. that. Yeah, <laughs> no, just a, just not even answering. Like Lin Swan at least put a statement out. Like, yeah, he's going to stay if they just, just backed away. Yeah, <laughs> he's going to stay, but they need to change. You know everything. And, no, I'm just saying yeah. if they didn't make an announcement at all, like that would just that would be, be complete bad. purgatory. Like people are like, are they going? When are they going to do something? Are they going to do something? And they just don't do anything at all. They're, I mean, they're definitely hitting the recruiting trail now. They had six mm-hmm. official visitors in this past weekend. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think the recruiting can get better. But if it's a, a Clay Helton returning thing, it's just 
not gonna, I don't think it's going to be significantly enough better that it will be. Uh, it'll definitely be the worst class we've ever seen. And probably even if they, you know, a new coaching staff comes in, depending on who it is, yeah. it would still be like it's an Urban be really Meyer difficult to jump. Because also there's just a there's a limited number of spots as well, and the point system goes by how many guys you have. Right, it'll so, be a smaller class. Uh -huh. uh, like an Urban Meyer could like you know that's nitroglycerin into the boom. It's just gonna make everything explode. But whoever it, the, if it's a different coach, and even if it's Clay Helton returning, I mean part of it will be maybe not as much with Clay Helton returning, but you know you need to delay the signing period. So most people like to sign in the early signing period now, which is to start December 18th. If you can come in, if you're the new coach, they hire Keeley, and she calls every recruit personally. She doesn't have a staff yet or anything. Like, all I want you to do is just wait till February. We're going to put something amazing together. Just wait, sign in February. It's going to be awesome. If you can get some people to delay and then buy some time, I think that would be a big step as well. But it's going to be tough for That's those high-end guys. There's yeah. a lot of high-end guys that are planning on signing on signing day. Either make an announcement on signing day. So, you know. They've already got their ceremony set up and stuff yeah. like that. So, and obviously, early enrollees won't, you know, that doesn't yeah, fall into yep. place. Yep, but yep. you you might want to keep spots open, and it is a really bad recruiting class. But you use a transfer portal and bring some dudes in. Um, but like the the more time you have to do all of these things, there's a lot of plans you could. There's a lot of different strategies you could have. Lane Kiffin came in with all these terrible recruiting sanctions and had a plan, and I thought his plan was actually pretty good, and it was working well until they had that terrible seven and six season and everyone dropped out. But um, you have to have some kind of plan. And the more time you have, uh, the better the plan, you know, the better chance the plan will work. Yep. Thanks for the call, 007. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, we have a full queue again, but I'm going to jump into questions just so our social media channels feel loved. Yes. First up, Hip Hop Lover John says, is Keaton Slovis officially the GOAT now? The GOAT what? <laughs> Do you not know what that means? Right? I know what it means, but I'm like, what is it? The greatest, the greatest quarterback in USC history? No. Like, what has he won? I'm going to go freshman, yes. What, what, what's his biggest win? Like, who, what what team did he beat that's amazing? I'm still going to give okay. him freshman goat. Um, it's so, it's no. a lighthearted comment, Ryan. Deep red. But go talk about, no. Like, <laughs> he threw over 500 yards against a 4-7 and seven UCLA team that gives up 300 yards a game. No, he's not freshman, the goat. Freshman goat. Yeah, he's the best. I mean, they just haven't met a lot of freshmen. Uh, he's the freshman goat. We'll give you that. Sure. Uh, Sid on YouTube says, considering Slovis appears to be the next all everything at SC, in your opinion, do you think Daniels may transfer if he loses out on the starting job next season? This is a really tough question to answer because of when JT will be coming back. Yep. You know, how quickly is he back? Is he back in time to compete in that fall camp? You know, I think he could end up he could end up potentially in a similar situation as Jack Sears, where he's gonna graduate at the end of the season, but you know, if he's been doing his, his coursework and stuff that he'll he'll be done at the end of the next season and then he could transfer as a grad transfer so do you try to leave early you know that type of thing um i think that i still think jack sears should have, should have stayed on the team you know he, since he didn't transfer anywhere this semester it's not like he's getting a leg up on you know running the next offense or trying to run the next offense when he could have potentially you know, been thrown in a game, you know, with the way their, their injuries happen. You know, one, one Matt Fink, you know, hit in the Washington game, and he would have been in there. Or maybe they decided he outplayed Matt Fink leading up to the Washington game and yeah. put him in, those type of things. So if even if he has decided he wanted to transfer, if he doesn't do it, like, immediately this offseason, I think he should stick out the next season. One, either to compete with Keaton Slovis if he's healthy and ready. If not, then you, you're still on the team. And if Slovis gets injured, then you go in and – you know, it, it could be the similar, just a ro role reversal for those two. I think Slovis right now is ahead, and I talked about this on a different show, I think on the Family Feud podcast too, about – Blood. Uh, they all are blending together at this point in the season. There's a lot of shows. Um, but I, I think that at this point they're probably around even, just seeing where JT was coming into the season versus where Keaton has progressed as the season has gone along. They're probably are about even, and maybe you say – JT's experience or is, is different than Keaton. Maybe you want to keep him ahead. But Keaton's going to have the next eight months to continue to progress while JT won't yeah. because he's going to be rehabbing or trying to return from that, that injury. So I think Keaton's going to be above him by the time you get to fall camp if he's not already there. Plus, you don't know what offense they're going to be running. It could be the same one. True. It also, could be different. Very good you know? point. I mean, even if Clayton sticks around, does Graham Harrell leave? And then you're I mean, who – I mean, there's – 
a lot of there's variables. a lot of variables yeah yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll people were like tweeting we about there. that like in the first the second quarter of the game talking about jt daniels i'm like people have been talking about that for weeks but it's like right in the middle of the game like you're playing ucla right now like you're worried about a guy that's like on the shelf like with knee surgery rehabbing like about i mean in september next year like I, it just didn't make a lot of sense to people me. are multitaskers ryan yes uh, we have a Facebook question from Mike, and I've actually seen this a lot in the comments. He says, let's say for the sake of argument that SC retains Clay Helton. Does Clancy Pendergast remain on the staff? Our defense struggled this season. And there was another question from someone, I'm sorry, it got lost in the traffic, about uh, do you think Clay Helton has the self-awareness to know that if he's retained, he needs to move on from Clancy Pendergast and John Baxter? Mike, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, after last year, like, you know, Swan's ridiculous statement, and what what changed? You know, like that's just one of the most ridiculous statements ever. Um, I With mean, knowledge. Yeah, but now you got to do it again. Like that. Like you you would essentially have to do this again by admitting, hey, you know what? We got better, but we're still not good enough in these areas. We're you know we shouldn't have four major special teams blunders in the first quarter. You know, we, we shouldn't give up 367 yards passing to Dorian Thompson Robinson and nearly 100 yards gained rushing. I mean, I, yeah, are you going to say things like that and make moves? It's hard for me to imagine Clay Helton staying and not and being able to stand pat again like he did after 2017. It just it doesn't seem possible. But how do you do that two years in a row? Like stay, but change a whole bunch of stuff again. You know, it's like you have a relationship. Like uh, let's not break up, but but you're gonna change all these things about you. And like oh okay, we're gonna break up again. No, no, but change all these things and we're gonna keep it. Like by this point, you're, that's probably not a match. Like that's you shouldn't be in that relationship anymore. If you have to make all these changes every year. Well, I think they're I think they've been basically tied at the hip. You know, Clancy with Clay Helton, that was the guy he wanted when he got the full-time gig. So the only thing that breaks that bind to me is if the, your boss says you have to get rid of these people. Yeah. Which so. is kind of what we saw last season with uh, uh, Neil Calloway. It's true. It's funny. I go back to when Clay Helton was named. The very weird time. Do you remember that? Like after beating right after UCLA, beating UCLA and then like getting smoked in the, the Pac-12 championship game. Uh, I was talking to like an insider I know, and you know I think it was pretty tight with his agent. And the plan was they were going to bring in like this stud defensive coordinator, you know. And uh, that's what I guess that was the original plan, and that never uh, never came to be. Um, so yeah, so it's still there. He's still it's still uh, Clancy, who we like. I, I like talking to Clancy a lot. I oh, think yeah. he's he gives us some really interesting insight when we talk to him. He's uh, you know it, it's but is it working? Well, the, hard to say. It goes back to my point about if you're going to say you're going to do a full rebuild and then not do it, and then the next season go, oops, maybe we should have. Yeah. It's like, what are, what are you doing here? <laughs> Just not. You, you can't make these incremental changes. Like, you have to, you know, Brian Kelly at least realized, like, hey, man, we're changing. And it seemed like Clay Helton was like, we're going to change, but we're going to, like, we're kind of going to change, but I want to make it not look as. You know, we're, I want to make it look like we're changing a lot, but we're, uh, we'll just move these guys around a little. I, I don't know. Uh, let's go to a question from Mark on YouTube who says, what are your thoughts on Clay Helton saying it's all about the kids, but then giving game balls to Mike Bone and uh, Carol Folt? What did Bone do to deserve the game ball? <laughs> and he asks, is it brown nosing by Clay? Yeah, I'm sure it's a little brown nosing. It's brown nosing. Um, but he, the reason why he said he gave them to those were both that it was their first win over UCLA. Not a terrible thing to give to your boss. Mike Bone beat UCLA earlier in the year. <laughs> it's true. At Cincinnati. That is true. He has two wins First over UCLA. First rivalry win over yes. UCLA. True, How yeah. about that? Um, but he also, I believe, gave game balls to the receivers as a collective group. I mean, there was no – the player of the game in the, the in-stadium announcement was the offense. So, yeah. you know, you could give a game ball to the offense in that one. I, and, you know, I think that was – was that, was that what he said last week? You know, it was too hard to give a game ball because the offense played so well as a he whole. Said, no, he said it was a, a, te a true team victory. So yeah. he said the whole team, not just the offense. Yeah. This one's just the offense. That wasn't a team victory. It was the offense victory. Ryan. This wasn't. Like, <laughs> the sass. Are you going to say the tonight. special team? No. Are you going to say the defense? No. <laughs> this was an offensive victory. In check over here. Uh, Sid says, do you think Tyler Vons could stay and be a Pittman type of player to the younger wide receivers, the senior uh, being the mentor, giving advice, and keeping a solid three, four wide receivers on the field all year next season? Yeah, I think so. I asked him about the, you know, evaluation. He still has, he said he's not making a decision. Not really worried about that right now, but there he's putting in the paperwork and all that stuff. Um, I'm not sure how he's going to test. I think he's more of a performer than like, I don't think he's going to run like the fastest 40 or he might have a like good vertical leap. I mean, you know what the skills he has, how smooth he is. He's just like a natural receiver, just really well, you know, just 
kind of his game's well defined. I think, uh, yeah, I, I think there's a chance he sticks around. It depends too what happens. Like if if Graham Harrell's back, I mean, it's probably a better chance he really likes it. Or if you know whoever, if, if someone's new coming in, um, does he like the offense, or is he like, you know, I'd rather just go because I don't want to learn a whole new thing again, and maybe I'm not going to look as good as I did in uh, Graham Harrell's offense. So hard to, I mean, hard to say. Doctor Incognito says, is UCLA in a better or worse position with Chip Kelly rather than SC with Helton? That's a that's a really good question there. <sighs> yeah. Um, That's why he's a doctor. Thanks, Dr. Doc. Uh, <laughs> I mean, USC as a program is in a better position. Like, if you gave Chip Kelly USC's roster, I would take Chip Kelly's team over. But would West you? Team. Because Chip Kelly will just run half the roster off. No, that's true. He <laughs> might he might run them off. Um, Chip Kelly's in it, man. I mean, I I mean, I think he's like world's better of a coach than than Clay Helton. But just the situation. he was was world's better. Of maybe a coach. not. Any, yeah, maybe not anymore. Why um, will he not run the offense that was so so successful? It's at like Oregon. he's trying to show everyone how smart he is. Well, by you know, the out. game evolves. That's what is you know, people used to run the wishbone. If I could, I'd run the wishbone. Yes, that these was are all quotes me. that he has said this season. It, it doesn't make any sense. There's a lot of things in the Pac-12 that do not make sense. Right. That's definitely one of them. Uh, you know, why USC is not dominating is one of them. Why Why Pac-12 is Washington uh, – That's uh, a given. Uh, wh- why is Washington 6-5 and five this year? I don't understand. I thought they were going to be pretty good. I, I mean, their I defense was bad. I mean, you got a better quarterback. Why is Larry Scott still employed? There's a lot why of is he the Pac-12 paid five is, is drunk. <laughs> this is a drunk Pac-12 year, and it's and it's soon year, as I do decade. A, yeah, so um, I get to do a, a brief TV hit after the game yesterday, and it's like recorded after the game, and they they play it like a few hours later. And of course, I talk about this is a real shot for the Pac-12. You could have a one you know one loss Oregon and one loss Utah. You the Pac-12 championship game could matter, and that would move USC up in the bowl pecking order. And like of course, by the time they play that. Oregon already has lost. I'm like, really, Oregon? Like, you lose to Arizona State and Herm Edwards. But they did. So that's it's the Pac-12 being drunk. That's why USC still has a shot that maybe – but I think Utah's not going to be drunk. I think Utah had their drunk moment. They uh, they had their one-night stand against you know USC and Los Angeles. I don't think they're going to they're gonna fall back into that trap again. I think they're going to roll Colorado. Interesting. So basically you cursed Oregon is what you're saying. Apparently, I apparently cursed, cursed, uh, cursed Oregon, yes. Uh, and the whole Pac-12, because that's really ruined the Pac-12. If USC could have been in the Alamo, you know, playing at the Alamo Dome and uh, the Alamo Bowl instead of the Holiday Bowl, which is, you know, that's the worst stadium in the country or one of them. That's why the Chargers aren't there anymore. Uh, but, you know, maybe Utah somehow sneaks in now. I, I mean, who knows? Or USC goes to the Rose Bowl because the Pac-12 is drunk. But. Auburn can still be Alabama. LSU beats Georgia. A couple of teams drop. Those things can still happen. It's just hard for you. Utah doesn't have a, a real quality win. And, um, and it depends on how far Oregon falls in a couple of days. Yeah. And yeah. Washington losing is big, too, because that would be another pa- top 25 team. Mm-hmm. They were on the cusp of top 25. They lose. Now they're not going to be in the top 25. So Utah's best, you know, their best, the best team they played is going to be USC. And they yeah. lost. <laughs> so it's like. Well, Oregon will still be ranked out above USC. Yeah, Oregon, but you know, if what, what if they beat them? Yeah. A uh, brick squad uh, says. Brick squad. Brick yes. squad says, how many players will USC have drafted in this class? Shotgun. Yeah, because he was very mad about my development comment, and I. Oh, okay. Um, so th- it's a very small senior class, and I don't think that it, the ju- <laughs> well the juniors. There's a couple guys who could leave. Yeah. You know, guys like Austin Jackson, who talk you talk to. Yeah. And he said that he has not made a decision or anything yet as well. He's His mock draft status has gone is all over they the place. They love him. Yeah. Now, some people think he can go all the way up to the first round right now. Uh, or he's a third to fourth round guy. You know, there's just been a lot, of, a lot of back and forth with him. I think if he comes back, he's a first round guy. Um, so we'll see what he is does. Is Chuma playing a bunch now? Or like Chuma he... is I, – I haven't seen – he started a couple games back. I, the Jets were on today, and I didn't watch. They, they won other. today, yeah. Like uh, Sam Darnold had a pretty big uh, uh, but, day. But, but, like, yeah. They, Those are guys who are like, he was a third-round pick, and they didn't really do much at USC. And they're like, oh, but he's actually a decent pro. So that's I think that's where the development thing comes Yeah, in. but but Michael Pittman will be – there's a couple of guys that will be drafted. The talent on this team is younger guys. There's a lot of guys that are they're first- and second-year guys that are draftable. You know talents. Uh, so they, if they 
continue to develop at the rate they did this season, I think, then I, I think that they will will be in the position where USC teams have had before where there's a lot of guys getting drafted type of thing. But the big concern is if you're getting that same type of talent in next year and building them up rather than it being, you know, if you're getting all three stars and moving them up to four-star status versus taking some four-star guys up to five-star status. Yeah. Um, John on Facebook, uh, I think he's trying to make a point with this question, uh, okay. which – didn't come up. He says, what's USC's record with Clay Helton against elite programs, uh, against elite programs? And I think he's also referring to if you keep if you keep Clay Helton, he's facing Alabama again next season uh, to start the season. Yeah, and someone else mentioned on here, I think it was Nuzu, that said, uh, you know, the fire Helton chance will start again as soon as they lose to Alabama. I was like, yeah, that'll start before then. Yeah. That'll be throughout the entire offseason. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean. I mean, it's continued since. Lynn Swan's announcement last season. That's where you look back at 2017 when, you know, yes, USC won the Pac-12. There was a lot of, you know, the Pac-12 isn't that good right now. And I think, look at the teams that USC beat. I mean, I, one team this season with a winning record, USC has a win over, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I think that's an issue. You know, Notre Dame, you know, their lead team. You know, when you play Ohio State, uh, you know, playing an Oregon team that was ranked the top 10, bad showings against those squads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that. how much credit are you getting for, for the, you know, beating the Arizonas of the world and all that? Well, last year, I mean, maybe you kind of set yourself up to give credit this year because last year you were losing to ASU and to Cal and to UCLA. It's like, well, you beat those teams this year, but none of those teams are, are still all that good, but at least you beat, you lost to them last year, at least you beat them this year. Like, that's the difference in the record from last year to this year, right? You have uh, three more wins. You know Arizona State, Cal, and uh, and uh, UCLA, and A ASU is going bowling at least. So there's, I think they're six and five. Uh, oh, actually, well, no. So yeah, they're they have a winning record now. So maybe that Arizona State, yeah. Uh, um, th you know, I said before last season, my thought on Clay Helton was he's going to win the games that he's supposed to win, and every once in a while he'll upset somebody. Yeah, but he's not going to consistently beat the top end teams. And then last year they kind of threw it off with, you know, the way they played in the second half of the season. It's kind of back to that now. They're going to beat the teams they're supposed to beat. That's what they've done so far this season, except for BYU. Um, he hadn't really been getting up. Washington. He hadn't been really been getting upset by teams yes. that were worse than him prior to last season. And that's kind of been the difference in the last year and a half is it, when you're losing the teams you're not supposed to. That's when there's so much more uproar. And I think that that's been the case because there were people after the Rose Bowl, after the Cotton Bowl, like Clay Helton's not the guy, he can't lead us to a national championship. And then it goes back to what are the expectations of the administration for the football program. And if he was going to go 10-2 and two and lose to, to two really good teams, then I thought the administration was fine with it. You know, they didn't, they weren't invested enough to, to care. Now when you go 5-7, and seven, this season you're back at 8-4 and four and it's kind of, you're kind of in that wishy-washy area. If they were coming off a ten and two season, you go eight and four, then you know you're like, uh, I don't know if this is right. But now it's just everyone has has already jumped off ship. Yeah, because of the five and seven season coupled with the eight and four. Yeah, two. So ASU, so USC did beat ASU, so it's a second team that has a winning record now. So they had the the big upset uh, over the past weekend. So thir thirteen eleven over the past two seasons. Uh, someone wanted to know, Chuck, and I think this is a question for you because you've answered it before. Does it seem like USC has more injuries? Uh, in the last couple seasons than other teams do? I don't – I wish that there was, like, a database of all injuries. Yeah, it's uh, hard to... But, yes, they, it's not just this season. So when people go, well, they had injuries this season. No, that's not an excuse because it's become a constant at USC. So that is under your watch. So whether it's the strength and conditioning, whether it's the um, the nutrition, whether it's the way you go about practice – Something under your watch as a head coach is causing that to be a problem, so you don't get any, you don't get to use that as an excuse. You can't be like, "Well, we had injuries." It doesn't matter. You've had injuries for three years, so it's your fault that you have, you're yeah. having injuries. It's not like they're freak injuries. These are football related injuries. It's not like guys are falling down steps. It's not Chad Wheeler getting hit with the medicine ball <laughs> in practice. Like that's a freak injury. Like how, how does that happen? That's also, you know, that's a disciplinary <laughs> discipline yeah. issue. <laughs> That's what this happened in practice. Yeah. But. I don't know what I was doing, but I was 
trying to Twitter advance search something, and Ryan, you were like, US, it was a tweet from like 2015, and you are like, USC had the gamut of, of reasons to miss practice. Cody Kessler missed it for grad school. <laughs> Chad Wheeler got hit by a medicine ball, and then something else happened. <laughs> so, interesting times. i have to go back here. and look at that tweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, let's go to a tweet we got from Mark, who said, I think he was referencing your three-prong thing, Shotgun. Okay. He said, the financial component of keeping uh, Helton, or hiring a lesser-known head coach, isn't going to produce the ticket sales or alumni donation expected so the short-term discomfort in cost is the cost of doing business given helton's unwarranted contract extension hey real quick big t uh also pointed out cal has a winning record now so they they came back and beat stanford scoring two touchdowns late in that game chase so. garbers chase uh, garbers the greatest quarterback in pac history back to um, the tweet sorry, sorry about that <laughs> no i just wanted like they pointed that out so it was good no, I think that I think I agree um, with, with what you're saying. If I'm understanding it correctly, from I can't see the full tweet. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's why I think it's in three components. I think there's the hiring coach, there's a lesser known coach, and there's keeping Helton. And I think you have to figure out the financial. That's why it's not just one one or the other to me. I think there's a financial risk assessment that has to be in each of those categories to figure out if it's the right move, if you're willing to make the move, those type things. More so than just is it performance on the field? Right. I think that that should be enough, but I think that it's not. I think all the other things are playing into it. Make the move. Lavisca shut out. What? <laughs> That's, good. That's the shut out Lavisca voice. He had a big game. He had, a, he had an awesome touchdown catch against Washington. That was pretty funny. Um, I'm going to jump back into callers and then probably go back to rapid fire because okay. we've already it's already eight sixteen. What's up, shotgun? I think Washington was like I a. Said okay. Oh, I think Washington's with double digit favorite like three or four times this year. I lost like crazy. And sometimes you just have a team that just does not perform. And I think that's the case for Chris Peterson. I still yeah. think he's a good coach. Oh, yeah, he's really good. But they are poo this year. Some people. I don't understand. And some, USC lost to him. Some people make fun of you, Ryan, for still being a Peterson fan given what happened this season. I mean, it's, it's, you get. I mean, you can have a bad season in college football. I mean, it happens. Like it's not, you know. And I can hear people saying, "Then why can't Clay Helton have a bad season?" Because he's had multiple bad seasons, and he has got way more talent than everybody else. Like Chris Peterson's taking guys and developing them, and uh, he's lost. You know, he had four guys drafted on, on his defense in the top forty-four picks a few years back, and then they came back and still had the top defense in the Pac-12. You're not seeing that with you. USC needs the players to do all those kind of things. Chris Peterson can do it by developing those guys. Now, this year, it's not working. He's got a really good quarterback, Jacob Eason, people think could be an NFL guy. The offense looks putrid. I mean, Colorado's given up more than 30 points a game, and Washington put up 14. Like, that, that's inexcusable. But I would say this is more of an anomaly than this is, like, what Chris, Chris Peterson is. Just wanted to preempt all the comments that would come in after you said No that. problem, so yeah. Just go, going I'm through at... it all. Uh, but let's jump into the queue. Uh, first up. I believe our caller is Jeff from Connecticut. Hello, you're live on television. Thank you. I uh, want to talk not about the coach for a second, but about the defensive line, which uh, seems to have three problems. One is it can't protect the edge. Two, it really doesn't pass rush very well. And uh, three, it has a terrible time capturing the quarterback, particularly when they're more mobile. So obviously, and, and these guys, forgetting the coach, are going to be many of them are going to be around next year. There's either a lack of speed or uh, maybe we should go to a 3-4. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I, I mean, I think that defensive line's played pretty well. I don't know about the contain really being as much of an issue. We've seen four man, more four-man fronts. I think they've done a good job stuffing the run up the middle. We've seen some good individual performances by the defensive linemen. Uh, I don't know if it's more of a scheme thing, but usually you're kind of those outside linebackers or when they're in there try to do some more on that. But I don't know. What do you think? I mean, last year, the, the previous years in the Clancy, they'd run more of basically a 2-4-5. Uh, he likes having the nickel back out there, especially in this conference. You're going to have a nickel back on the field most of the time, 80% of the time almost. Um, and that's any defense. That's not just USC's. It's just the proliferation of how many wide receivers are on the field. You don't want, you know, Kanai Malga chasing after a slot receiver. You don't want him chasing after Kyle Phillips yesterday, no. that type of thing. Or Devin uh, Ossie, I think. <laughs> Not Devin Austin. You don't want him chasing after him. You don't want him covering him. Um, but I think that the, the, that's part of the reason why you see the, the way they've done. Now, Drake Jackson and Christian Rector being true defensive ends are why they went with the more 4-3 look this season. They It's just kind of a, a mismatch of a – of a scheme there with the the outside linebackers versus defensive ends and kind of using them interchangeably 
for for to an extent, I guess, yeah. because you know it just depends on what the opponents are doing. Maybe that's um, some of it. Is that they are kind of going back and forth. It's not really this is the scheme. It's like, yeah. well, sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that. And so I, you know, I've really liked it when they've gone with an actual four three look with three linebackers and used Elijah Winston in there against like run formations and stuff. They've looked. I think Elijah Winston's made a lot of plays. Has made an impact when he's been in the games. And they would move like Drake Jackson inside a little bit. No, they just they keep those guys out there. They just bring they take out the nickel back, and put an extra linebacker oh, okay, in. Okay. Uh, so a true four three look in that Not way. Not the third down stuff when they no. move the guys inside. Okay. No, but I I really like Drake Jackson when he moves inside too. Uh, they just. Talented pass rushers, but the reason why the number one player, the number two player in the country, one of the top two players is almost always a pass, pass rusher. rusher. Yeah, every recruiting class, because they are game changers. Look at what Chase Young is doing. You know, when you have an elite guy, it changes everything for an offense. They have to either double team you, they have to chip, they have to extra blockers. You completely change the game. Drake Jackson has the potential to be one of those type guys. Uh, but And I think the two defensive tackles, the three guys in the middle, the defensive tackle rotation they've had, have played really well at stopping the run up the yeah. middle. And I don't think speed's an issue, like uh, Jeff was saying. I mean, but they can they can get speed with Hunter Eccles, Juliana Falonico, Abdul Malik McClain. But those guys, they, it's it's not a consistent speed and power, which is what you had with Port Augustine, which is why he was he was good. Now, it wasn't elite speed, and it was elite power, uh, but yes. he got to the quarterback consistently. No one else is really doing that, uh, you know, just on a per-snap basis. I looked at that, you know, in the Abdul Malik McClain story I did, you know, I looked at some of the numbers of guys and how, they, how well they rushed the passer. They just don't have that elite pass rusher, uh, and – Maybe Drake Jackson becomes that later in his career. You know, he's only a freshman. He's got five and a half sacks. That's solid. Maybe one of those other guys develops into it. Maybe they adjust the scheme. Those are all, you know, I, I think those are questions that will come with time if Clancy Pendergast is still here um, and who transfers out. Because if Clay Helton is retained, this is something that's been going through the the uh, feed on YouTube. There will be transfers. There are, there are yeah. several players that are not happy, so there will be transfers. They're waiting, just like recruits, to see what exactly happens whether they want to leave the school or whether they want to leave Clay Helton. Yeah. You know, those are the two things that they're kind of looking at. There will be more negative stories coming. We know that. Uh, thank you for the call, Jeff. Let's go to our next caller in the queue, who I believe is Mitchell from Utah. Hello, you're live on Tunnel Vision. Hey, guys. How's it going? What's up, Mitchell? Uh, so I don't know what your guys' perspective on this is. Like, Mike Bell came in, and he's been very adamant that he wants to listen and learn kind of getting nervous that he's falling into the wanting to learn too much and not taking any action. What are you guys' thoughts on that? And if Clay, or not if Clay, if uh, Urban Meyer comes in, can he save a group group like Elijah or Justin Flo or, or flip one of the two big quarterbacks to in like California? Thanks. Thanks, Mitchell. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think he's being true to his word. He's trying to get out there and meet as many people as possible. Everyone I've talked to that's had an interaction with Mike Bone has come away with very positive things to say. The problem is that you know you just knew when he was coming in, he was coming into this whirlwind of controversy and all this stuff that was going to be happening, and nothing he could do was going to be fast enough. And uh, I think Carol Fult moved quickly. I, I, it would have been you know if she could have got someone in even faster than she did, I think it would have been better. But he came in. It's only been a few weeks. It, you, you knew this was going to be coming down the stretch. He saw the Oregon game. Then he saw you know USC get a few wins. And uh, you know now he's got to do something. And I think the next week we'll know a lot more. I wouldn't get too nervous yet. If something happens a week from now and we still haven't heard anything, then you might want to get nervous. Maybe he's listening a little too much. And yeah, I think a guy like Urban Meyer would would flip the switch on a lot of those guys. Um, that are out there. You know, some of the dudes that are committed to Texas, they're not doing so well. You could flip them maybe. So there's there's some some hope there with uh, Urban or somebody else. If uh, if they get in early enough in the recruiting process, you know, before the, the 18th where they can actually make a difference. I think it would be disingenuous if he has done something already, like sooner than what the caller wanted, I think, um, just because he, I think he has to kind of settle in a little bit before making those moves. Yeah, it's three weeks on the job as yeah. of tomorrow. So. Yeah. Yeah, can't really come. But, in hot. but there's been a lot. Everyone we've talked to, they've <clears throat> enjoyed uh, chatting with him. Our, our buddy USC Psycho was having his Psycho Gate and tried to get a pic. Someone took a picture of him talking with Mike Bone. So Mike Bone, you know, talked to USC's biggest super fan, the guy with the license plate. But he was wearing a Higher Meyer shirt, and so Mike Bone wasn't going. You know, at least according to uh, 
Roy, you know, Roy's tweet that he wasn't going to take a picture with him because that was, some people took a picture of them talking, but they weren't posing for a picture because, I mean, that probably he said it was. He was not going to take a picture with him wearing that shirt. Yes. He gave him a little pause. Oh, so you were there, right? Here, I right? was not there, but I, I got oh. the whole story later. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> nice. Well, let's go to our next caller in the queue. Hello, you're live on Tunnel Vision. Hi. So I'm going to be completely honest. I'm not a Trojan fan, but I've been following the program for years because there's just so much chaotic, just <laughs> – fascination it's good tv uh, yeah. it's it really is it truly is like why am i listening to you guys now and but what gets me about clay helton is it just oh it ticks me off so bad because to have that much talent that many resources so much potential and to get paid millions to squander it is borderline unforgivable i mean i'm okay now i'm gonna take some for this i'm an oregon state fan okay but do you, you think I, if we had even half the talent and resources you guys had, we would be over the moon? And we, I hear the national media, and they're doing the thing like, oh, you know, Clay Helton's such a nice guy, and he yeah, has going the right direction. It's like, dude, like, he won a Rose Bowl. It's like he backed into the Rose Bowl. He had three losses that year. He only went because Washington was a playoff. He didn't win the division that year. It's like, are you kidding me? Uh, it's like we had Mike Riley up here. I mean, he was trending down. It was time for him to go. He went to Nebraska. We saw how that went. He flamed out. Okay, but, oh, the media narrative. He's such a nice guy. He's such a nice guy. You can't get rid of him. He did all these things. He did this. Or, you know, it's like, no, what is he doing now? Nothing. Oh, it's, it's, I feel for you guys in that way. So it's like, you know, being nice is not a justification to keep your job. That's all. I, I, I had to get that out. I, I hope. <laughs> I, so. I love the amusement. But I hope that, I mean, I like it when USC does well. You know, like when 2006, 2008, we beat you guys. Like it meant something because no one beat you guys. Yeah. And now I see like USC taking losses multiple times a year. And it's like it makes everyone look bad. And I know you guys feel crap about it. And I like you guys. I mean, you have some really good media people and some interesting fans. And I know people went to USC. And I mean, it's just a sad situation. So I hope they can get this resolved quickly. Well, thanks. Hey, thanks. For, that's an thanks awesome call, call, by the way. First of all, who knows pain like Oregon State fans? I was going to say, this is why he's paying attention. They know he has pain. A lot of time on his hands. And he's like, oh, there's, look at USC. There's some similar pain there. Uh, that's a, I mean, great informed call. We USC sucked him in, and then he's upset about what's going on with USC. I feel like this <laughs> they is sucked just in like... an Oregon State fan into this black hole of what is going on. Like, <laughs> that's kind of like a black hole. That is amazing. Oh. <laughs> the, the passion and the gusto in the call. That he, might be caller of the, the week or something. I uh, think. He, he was pretty good, yeah. I must say. I mean, I, man, I love, like, Angie Machado does a great job covering the Beavers up there. I mean, they lost. They should have beat Washington State. They lose 55, 54 to 53. Like, give up 600-something yards to uh, Anthony Gordon. Like, oh, my God. Like, they have some talent on that Oregon State team. And Jonathan Smith might be a candidate for uh, for Coach of the Year. Uh, probably going to go to Whittingham now that, that Chris Ball lost. But if, he, if they could have beat Washington State, um, now it's just going to be tough uh, on Oregon State. But, man, that was that was a heartbreaker that they lost last night. Yep. I love how one of the best calls of the of the season is not from a USC fan. It's an Oregon State fan. passionate pain. rant, not they, from a USC. They fan. know pain. They definitely know pain. But <laughs> they, but he's right though. But you know, so I know the Pac-12 a lot. If you're like an Oregon fan or you know whatever uh, Utah, fan, like you don't want to see USC do well. He gets it though. But it's like if USC is doing well, that's the easiest. If USC had or Utah's resume, they would be in the pack. They, they'd be in the playoff. Like Utah is not gonna get in. If it was USC, just change everything else and just change the name. They would be in but on reputation, and they have that that ca that cachet, that brand. So it meant something. He knows in 2006 or 2008, it meant something when Oregon State beat, U beat USC. When USC's down and they're five and seven, did it mean as much to Cal? Did it mean it? You know, they hadn't beat USC in like a decade and a half, so maybe it did, but it doesn't mean as much. And now it does. And so the whole Pac-12, if USC is really good, it helps the entire Pac-12. And then if you're good enough to beat a really good USC. That lifts your boat up even higher. So I, yeah, I, I, I think he gets it. Yep. All right. Let's go to let's go through these callers. We had two more callers, and then I'm cutting off the queue. But yeah, let's go. It's like eight thirty. I yeah. know it's crazy. Um, hello, you're live on Tunnel Vision. Thanks for taking the call. This is Hugh from Simi Valley. Uh, my question that I have, I don't know if you have an answer for, but as I looked at the injuries list before the UCLA game, uh, they went through the list on TV and they showed SC's list. And it just seems to me that under Clay Helton, I recognize we have a new strength and conditioning coach, and everyone was really high on him. How is it we seem to lead the Pac-12 and more in injuries that are season-ending uh, more than any other team by, like, 
ridiculous. It was like two, two or three to one, the injury list. And I'm hoping you guys can comment on it and tell me why that would be under Helmer. Why? Thanks, Hugh. Yeah, Shotgun talked about that a little bit earlier. It's not, I mean, I mean, injuries are going to happen. It's football that happens. But when you do see inflated levels year after year and you've changed strength coaches, I think there's something more systematic going on in the program. It could be a combination of things. If you practice harder, do you are, are you less likely to get injured in games because you're working? I mean, different factors. I don't think you can say this is exactly what it is, but you do have a body of work, and you know, for some reason, under this you know coaching staff, you're seeing injuries that are higher, and you've seen some different things happen. Now, maybe year two of Aaron Osmus injuries go down, maybe they go up. We don't know. It's just hard to say. But I, I think. There's no exact science to this, but it does appear to be some somewhat of an issue. I just don't think you can put your finger on it like this is what it is. And we've talked about this with Taylor Mays previously, and t part of it goes back to tackling. There are certain injuries that have happened where it's because they don't have the proper tackling technique. They try to do things like stick their arm out, and that's when they have some shoulder injuries and stuff. And Taylor said that's something that happened to him in the NFL when he got away from his training. I don't know that they have enough training on tackling, which is why they struggle with tackling in, in games, but also why they may get some some injuries because of, of those type of things. Now, you're going to have guys get rolled up on. You're going to have ankles and stuff every single year. Happens to everybody. Ankles, knees, those things happen. They're unfortunate. You, you don't want to see anybody get hurt unless it's your rival and it's just for that week. You know, <laughs> you just want to see them out for a week. Uh, but Honorary shotgun today. <laughs> but it, it, the – consistency with which USC has got it, it's a trend. It's not an aberration. It's not an excuse to use for a season because it is a trend. So that, and like I said, that goes back to the head coach. It's your program. You have to figure out what is different, whether you have to tell the training staff, like you guys need to do this differently, whatever, you know, you have to be able to figure it out. Whether you have to tell the strength and the conditioning, we need to let, we need to lessen this. We need to toughen up on this area, whatever has to be done. It goes back to the head coach. You're the guy at the top of the program. You have to make that uh, make that call. And it's not like like other sports. You just know that USC has a rash of injuries in every sport. You know that's not a common theme across the campus. It's the football program. Yeah. Thank you for the call. Let's go to our final caller in the queue, and then we're going to go into rapid fire. Hello, you are live on television. Hi. Hi, it's Dr. K from Salt Lake City. Um, I want to put each of you into a being a potential coach position. Okay. Um, Ryan, or I I mean, Shotgun, you would be, okay, yeah. Um, Shotgun, you'd be high end. Um, Ryan, you would be kind of in the middle. This is based on Shotgun's formula. And Keeley, you would be the youngest, but you would be um, the long-term possible coach. Well, now, here's the question I have for you as I interview each of you and how you would answer the question. Okay. So you're going to be playing Alabama next year. You're going to be playing at Utah next year and possibly, I think, at Oregon. Potentially three losses. So most likely there might not be a big difference from this year to next year, although I will preface, aside from being the interviewee, I agree 100% with Ryan on the move. Uh, I'll, uh, thanks for taking my call, and I'll listen, and I'll hang up. Thanks. Dr. K. I'm a so, little confused. What was the question? I don't know. If I missed that. I, I'm confused. So I don't know if we're supposed to sell, you know, wh how, why we should be the right candidate. Uh, Maybe that's it. Even though th there's going to be those three potential losses, or if we want to even take the job because we know there's going to be three losses. But if yeah. I'm the high end okay. guy, I know that I can win. I've already proven it at other places. I know there's talent on this roster. Even if I'm playing Alabama first game, like I get a pass on that. It's my first game. You know, we're still installing our, st we're still getting used to our stuff. You got the coach speak down. Yeah, and yeah. we we can build up as the season goes along. We've seen what USC can do, even though they lost Alabama, get demolished by Alabama in the first game. Still Rose made it Bowl. to a Rose Bowl. Yeah, and won the Rose Bowl. So I can sell that to the program, even if we struggle against Alabama. I can say, hey, that's where we need to be, guys. That's what we're shooting for. We're gonna be, you know, we're working our way to that. You know, and now you know where the level is that we have to be at now. And now when we go to Utah and we go to Oregon, I have confidence in my team. We're going to get better week by week, and we're going to continue to to build. And then when we go play them, we're going to upset at least one of them, if not both of them. Yeah. See, you if don't. It's even an upset. Ready for this. You don't want 
that you know, yeah, Urban Meyer's great. You know what? You want the guy that took Western Michigan and made Are him a power. Are you selling yourself right now? Yeah. Okay, I mean, got it. You 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 want the guy who went to Minnesota and was able to knock off Penn State. You want the up and comer. Those are the guys. I know what I'm doing. Knocking off. No, you're the you're the the. You're I'm the, the up and comer. You're the Clay Helton. I was the medium one. <laughs> no, I'm the young. <laughs> Person you're the, with yeah, potential. I think you're the inexperienced Clay Helton. I thought that's what that's he was saying. That's not what he said. Thank you very much. Then who's, Clay, your own interview. Then who's Clay Helton in this thing? That's not the point. Just go make your case. I'm the PJ Fleck of this thing. <laughs> we're talking about, what do, why do people like me get hired? Because we knock off the Giants. Where are the Minnesotas that knock off the Penn States? I'm going to give you your best shot to knock off Alabama next time. It's not worked out well the last couple of times. <clears throat> it's going to work out well with me coming in there. We're going to row the boat all the way to a win over the Crimson Tide. Well done. See, okay, I'm the young up-and-comer. I'm the Cliff Kingsbury. I'm the Graham Harrell. Get on the train so we can ride it to victory. Who loves a, a, a underdog story? Everyone does. The media does. It would be great to brand me, you know, if we want to go. If I'm still a female in this situation, first coach, <laughs> everyone loves that. You know, just just do it. Nice. <laughs> That's what I have to say. Nice. Thanks, Dr. K, thanks, for Dr. the K. thought experiment. I thought there was someone – I thought it was – Shotgun's thing where like the third option was keeping Clay Helton. He kind of switched it a little bit. Okay, so he switched it up. He there. just wanted to Hopefully give it that we sold one. it on you, Dr. No, K. Uh, I thought it was just a general thing, not like actually putting it to the scenario. But okay. It makes sense. I'm not sure. Uh, let's go to our rapid fire questions. First up, um, Tommy White says, Ryan, bottom line, is there any intel on if Urban Meyer has shown interest? That's all I want to know. Any evidence at all or just Let wishful thinking? I put Thank some notes you. here somewhere. Um, <laughs> Do you have notes ever? Oh, Not someone said I'm, I'm good. I'm a good hire because I have no baggage. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's, that's good. good. I like too. that. No like baggage. That. Um, we've heard a lot of different things. You don't know what it's – I mean, people are saying that he bought a house in the South Bay. We put that in the war room. That's not true, that he didn't do that. Um, there's real concerns there. Uh, I think there's real interest there. Will it come together? It's just hard to say at this point. But that's, that's, the, that's the number one direction that they need to go but I, i'm not sure unless they put some amazing package together and make him say no i think it's gonna be tough for him to to pick, take the job ron says is it possible to reassign clay helton to a different job like a recruiting area type job since players like him um he, he, to earn his owed salary he can quit and leave the money so I'm pretty sure there's a California state law or maybe even a national law that, no, you cannot do that. You can't just reassign someone completely. You know, if you've hired – you hire them for the position. So if you reassign them, you have to change the contract and everything. So they would have to agree to that. Uh, and no one's going to agree to changing to recruiting coordinator. No. And that's just a terrible idea. Like, you've got to fire him. He's gone. Like, don't wh – why would you want to keep him around? Like, no. If yeah. you're going to part – if you want to keep him around, you keep him around. If you want to get rid of him – you get rid of them. Like, yeah, you don't – because then you have the potential of poison in the water. Yeah. You know, the uh, where some players really like the old coach, some players, you know, and, you know, they don't get along with the new coach or something. So you can poison the water that way and you, the locker room can be divided. Yeah. Antonio says, if Coach Helton stays, what does he and the USC admin, Mike Bone, careful, need to do to improve attendance? <laughs> I, I mean – Win a hell of a lot of the games. Beat Alabama. Like, the, it, you're going to see what happened this year happen last year. USC started off three and three, and even though they won five of the last six, it still you still weren't getting butts in the seats in the Coliseum. So, the, what's the early part of the schedule? I think Utah's early, Alabama's early. So if you have two early losses, you pretty much lost the season. Like people aren't going to care anymore. So you'd have to go out and beat one or both of those teams to convince people that Clay Helton's the right guy. Like. Unless they go undefeated and they're winning every game, I don't think you're going to get people showing up at the Coliseum. Like you, you're going to have to really go over the top, winning wise, which means beating Alabama to start the season yeah. to get the fans back because the fans are not into it. Shotgun. There's not much you can do. Yeah. Besides beating Alabama, I mean, you you have an opportunity. Like I'm saying, to, well, I guess because that game comes before any home game, so yeah, that could be. Yeah, if you beat Alabama, I think people are be pretty damn excited. Yeah, but you get smoked by Alabama again, they're going to be so so so. They're not going to be excited coming into that game. They might be excited for a quarter and a half when Max uh, Max Brown gets them to have a three nothing lead or whatever, and then then you know, giving up fifty straight points or whatever it was, then the rest of the season they're not going to be excited. I don't think there's a possibility of. Starting off, oh, lost to Alabama, lost to Utah, but then made a run at the Rose Bowl. I just people are still not going to show up. 
Um, Sinke on YouTube has uh, a follow-up about the Austin Jackson talk that we were uh, saying as far as NFL and whatnot. He says, the Austin Jackson hype is a little ridiculous. I don't think his grades are matching the hype. He's athletic, so people trip. It's called potential. Yep. And because he's athletic and because he can block, you know, even if he, his grades aren't, you know, if we're talking about pro football focus, his per-game grades aren't tremendous, people see the potential and say, well, we get him in our system – we get him different yeah. coaching. We get him not having had Neil Callaway for two years. You know, they they maybe even look at the Neil Callaway thing as a positive for him and say, look how raw he is because he had two years with Neil Callaway. <laughs> you know, he's had one year with Drevno. Now, when we get a hold of him, if he were to come out after this year, he's got a chance to just take off and be a steal. You know, that's that's probably that's one way that people look at it, and it'll depend on how he works out and all those things yeah. too. Did Chuma Doga do enough at USC to warrant him him being a third round pick? No, it was, he had potential. Like people looked at the potential, and also people, really nimble, great feet. Yeah, I mean, he's got he's athleticism. Austin Jackson is ath- athletic, you know. So I mean, that's why you would draft him. It doesn't mean well he hasn't performed well at USC. It's like well, I mean, that could be more of USC thing than a Austin Jackson thing or a Chuma Doga thing. NFL don't care about production. No. Potential. Potential yeah. is the number one thing. It's more important than production. Ron on YouTube, Ron on YouTube says, Fult and Bone actually have nothing to lose if they keep Clay Hilton. It seems they just got hired, big contracts, and they can just be the adults in the room. And he takes that's nothing kind of to a, lose. That's that's a horrible take. They got everything to lose. If they keep him around for another year, it and then they hire someone that goes on to win a couple of national championships. Is did it? Is it a mark on their? Time at USC as athletic director or president that they kept him around for a year and no one will remember it. Well, I think the problem is you're you're losing. USC was banking on these kind of group of fans that are never going to go away. Well, they've started to go away, and you keep them around another year. And there's more of them going to go away, and this is a time when there's so much going on in Los Angeles. You might have lost like a college football fan, a USC athletics fan for life like you might have they just might be gone and it's not an easy time it's hard to fill up those stadiums and even Alabama and and LSU like it's not always easy to do that and I think USC is in a really tough spot I I think you do this one more year I don't I don't think they can afford to do it I just don't I mean okay but my question is do you really you have thrown out that you lose USC fans for life do you really lose USC fans for life they'll come back around Will they? I mean, I just there's so much going on right now in the world. It's not the same sort of thing that we've seen before. I mean, there's people that are really like they love our coverage or they love this, but like I can't stand the way the team is. I just need to walk away. I don't want to. I don't want this to be a part of my life anymore. And I, it's sort of like analogous to uh, just my personal experience when I started the website early on. It was because you know I went to USC, a huge USC football fan. But once it becomes like a business in your life, like. And you're in the media, you have to sign all this stuff. Like, you can't be a fan anymore, you know? And that's that was something I was so passionate about, and it's gone. And um, it's gone for a reason, because we're doing this as a business, and I can't go out there and talk to recruits and be like, yeah, yeah, go USC. I mean, that's an NCAA violation. Like, you can't do that anymore. But I feel like some people are going to be in the same re- – not for the same reason, but in the same boat where they lose that passion, that fandom, and – yeah, they might go to an occasional game or something, but they're not going to follow recruiting. They're not going to follow it as closely as they have. Just to a lot of the people we've talked to, it just seems like that's in danger of happening. And another year of this mediocrity, I, I, I think you're going to lose a lot of people. That, that's just my personal opinion. If things come roaring back, you know, if you go from the Ted Tolner to getting Pete Carroll and things start roaring back, a lot of things start coming back. A lot of fans start coming back, a lot of, but it takes that. And it becomes it becomes more difficult to get those people back if you lose them when they've been you know when they have been lifelong. Fans. Yeah, yeah. You better be like not you know ten and two is not bringing those people back. It's winning thirty four straight games like Pete Carroll did something like that. We shall see. Which is obviously not easy to do. Doesn't happen very often. Yeah, hmm. obviously. Um, Shotgun. I know there's probably things I missed that you would like to address. So this is your window to do so. I think you've covered most of it. Uh, Roland did ask that Slovis Slovis threw three picks how many times this year? Against good teams, the offense can't do anything. That was twice. BYU, first road start. Oregon, where a guy slipped and a a guy got hit. If you want to say those are the two best defenses, where he also played, he didn't throw any interceptions against Notre Dame. Um, You know, he's looked the Cal secondary, which is – Highly touted. 
He looked really good against them. Didn't throw any interceptions against them. So I think it's just you're seeing the progression of a freshman early on in his career versus, you know, now he's playing much better. I don't think that the, the offense can't do anything against good defense. I think they're rolling right now, and I think that the team has come along. The bigger question, if they were to go up against an Alabama, Clemson, LSU, would be the offense line holding up enough for him to have time and for him to escape some to throw the ball because the wide receivers will get open. They will. Shottington, is that it? Uh, Trek said if Helton came back, he has, what, one year left on this contract? I doubt they will give him another contract, so how does that help recruiting? He has no, it's multiple through like, years. He's yeah. through 2023 is when his contract. Yeah. That was the extension he was given last year. I believe the yeah, previous one, one was him. through 2021, and I think he got a two-year extension. Yeah. So there's still a few more years on it. And when you extend a coach, usually as an athletic director, it's because, like, what happened in Minnesota – they gave P.J. Fleck an extension because a lot of people were going to be trying to hire him. You're competing against other universities, and maybe you're at this level of university, and universities at this level are trying to get your guy. No one was competing for Clay Helton, and inexplicably, Lin Swan gave him an extension. Like, they were competing against somebody, which they were not. So, again, inexperienced athletic director makes horrible decision, and now there's a mess that USC is dealing with because of it. Sid wanted to know Slovis is talented, but how much of that quote unquote talent is due to the fact that he has the best wide receivers in the country? Couldn't like Fink versus Stanford, maybe uh, it means Utah. Uh, a decent quarterback find the open guy. Fink wasn't able to do that against Washington. Um, yes, a decent quarterback can, but can they do the special things like moving around the pocket like Slovis has done and shown the last few weeks to consistently throw over 400 yards? It's one thing to do in one game, it's different when you do it four out of the last five weeks uh, for him. So I, I think that's where you're seeing the talent from. He's got some really good arm strength, but the other things that he's doing, especially in the second half of the season, are why Graham Harrell will tell you. Like I said, <laughs> he's special. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he said that over and over. Sid also has a problem with uh, Ben Griffiths. He, didn't, he doesn't know why. He's just he's had several comments about Ben Griffiths, and I don't I'm, he averaged like 41 yards a punt. He had three punts uh, yesterday. It wasn't anything. It was nothing special yesterday, but no. he's been pretty darn good the second half of the season. Um, he's over four. He's like 41 yards per punt on the season. Yeah. So he's he's fine, but he's not like what he he's not at the level that we talked about like going into the season. So that's that's the problem people if, have. If he just punted, he's an effective to where punter. He can. We've he's an effective. Seen it though in practice. He's an effective Still, punter, but he's not. You know. Day. Yeah. And, uh, truther. Oh, ben Griffith is truther. Sorry, continue. And lastly, Bernie said, can you guys do an annual review grade for each player? We're beating a dead horse this entire podcast. Helton decision is coming. Please just put some focus on the player's performance. We've got an entire offseason for that. There's still a month before the yes. bowl game. The Helton decision may be made tomorrow, so that's why we're discussing it. It's, it's called and, yeah. the imperative news versus the news that can be told next week. Yeah, and I did like a podcast with Harvey Hyde this morning. We had a whole lot of questions. We got voicemails. We got text we got emails and i don't know if there was one about like specifics of the game like or, or you know the play it was really all about clay helton that's what people are curious about that's why we you know we talked about the game at the beginning of the show so go back you can watch yeah. that if you want but the majority is going to be about the future of clay helton because that's what the fans care about we want to talk what you care about and yeah. that's what but speaking of off-season programming, but we didn't have time to do this before the season started, but we had actually thought about doing USC Jeopardy with Ryan, Gerard Martinez, and Dan Weber doing that as a live show. So if there's interest, Jeopardy. So we, we might do it in the off-season. Just throwing that out there. I like that. That's cool. I, I think, think, it would be I think we'll try to get some guests on and stuff. We'll, yes. we'll have some fun. We, are, we won't do a show. I was going to ask you that too, Ryan. Yeah, Thanksgiving, we're not going to do a show. Um, probably... Sunday because it'll be we'll know what's going on so we'll do a show Sunday we'll week from okay. today we're not gonna do a Thanksgiving show okay there might be some news there might not be but whatever well I think probably Sunday's a good time to do the show unless I have an emergency tunnel vision because we might have to do that you know who knows um, I don't know uh, and, and last thing that I had was S. Dresden has said, at what point in his life did Bone ever coach football? I just wanted to say that Mike Bone was very invested on the sideline. I was in front of him shooting photos at one point and just listening to him right before the half. He was just, 
you know, he was very invested. Like, oh, we can't can't give the ball back to him now. Like, he's like all in on it. And, and so that tells you what kind of athletic director he is. Where Lynn Swan may not have known that the football <laughs> game was going on, even though he was at it. Even though his background in football, he probably just could have cared less. Yeah. Uh, so he or couldn't have cared less that, right. that he was there and maybe was disappointed that he had to be there rather than going out and enjoying himself doing something else, maybe a little round of golf or whatever it is. I don't know that he found enjoyment from going to USC football games, whereas Mike Bone is completely invested He's in. and going. He's talking to donors, but at the same time, and boosters or whoever else is on the sideline. And then at the same time, he's like, you know, we got to run the clock down right here. Got to, got to, yeah. Can't give the ball back to him. <laughs> he was, I mean, when I sat with him at the basketball game, he was into whatever the game, you know, Cincinnati's obviously a big basketball school. Uh, he hired Luke Fickle for the football team, and they're doing well too. But, yeah, he was into like, oh, man, they're not doing a good job shooting. He was just talking. He was into the game and asking questions about, you know, what was going on. So he's he's a he, he's a hands-on athletic director, and I think that's uh, it's nice to see. He's He cares about the people. He cares about the student-athletes. He's willing to talk and listen to anybody. So, uh, you know, he's made a give strong a chance, early you know. impression. Yeah, give him a chance. We we don't know, but early uh, early results are good. Yep. Early returns, whatever. Early yeah. impression. Yeah, early no, impression. There's no results or impression. Re- was it the, Unless you the count return? Unless you're football like, games. Yeah, yeah. He's he's trending up. It's like, his, you know, all his the votes aren't counted yet. Up. All the votes aren't counted yet. That's but his, uh, he's winning his district, you know. Already. I think that's going to wrap it up. I love how <laughs> we had a mic on back and Ryan was like, let's keep this short. And then we almost went two hours. It happens. It's that time of the season. Did Things the people are hear going that on. Yeah. I think so. Um, but that's going to wrap it up. Like like Ryan said, uh, we will not be here on Thursday. Yes, Shotgun? Someone said hands on. That's funny after this game. Apparently he patted Clay Hilton on the butt or something. I don't. I haven't seen this yet. They have even like a good hug and embrace like at half at the after the game. But I don't know. I didn't see any butt padding. Maybe it was there. Yeah. I'm glad we're ending on butt padding. Uh, that's gonna wrap it up for this week. It's almost show. two hours. We just sit here talking the whole time. Crazy, right? Crazy. Uh, we're not gonna be here on Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving Happy to Thanksgiving, everyone. Everybody. We will be back on Sunday talking about probably we will know bowls at that point. Bowls, bowls, yes. Uh, yep. Selection Sunday, so we'll yeah, bowls? we should know the bowl, yeah. No. Bowls, so that will be we'll fun to talk about. Much know what it's going to be. One of, yeah, one or two we'll choices. See. Hey, you never know. Any given Saturday. It's actually three, but yeah. <laughs> that's going to wrap it up. I'm, I'm cutting this all off. Uh, that's yes, shotgun. Uh, you guys don't have to be thankful for Clay Helton, but be thankful that there's college football, and we're thankful what? for you guys. What? So thanks for joining oh, us so much, you know, throughout the season and through all the ups and downs. The ups of Keaton Slovis and history made against UCLA. Even though Ryan's wearing UCLA colors, I wear USC. Random, but also some people don't want me to wear orange in the Coliseum. I'm I, wearing both of you. Sorry, I was really excited. You're blue. You're red, and I'm purple. Sorry. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Don't know why I was so excited. Well, we are about. thankful for all of you. I'm yes, thankful for you, you guys. I think my whole staff, oh, Keely and Shotgun and Dan and Gerard and Chris and all the 247 folks that help uh, run the site. It's awesome. So we appreciate all of you. I yes. appreciate all of you guys. Why, thank you. So sentimental to end the show. Yeah. So we're not ending it on butt padding. It's it's on things. Well, now we are. <laughs> now we are. Well, so my bad. <laughs> all righty. That's going to wrap up. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's going to wrap it up. That's Shotgun, who's face palming for me. That's Ryan. I'm Keely. We'll see y'all on Sunday. See Bye. You. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>